Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This, in fact, is my last show before I take a couple of breaks hiatus because I'm going off to San Diego to appear at the Society of Military History Conference, talking about YouTubing as a wings of sharing history. And then I've got a week-long tour, and normally I'm doing. And then back after that, just so you're, you're, you know, we've got, we've got a Balkans week coming up. We've got a Gliders week coming up. Lots of stuff coming up. But anyway, my guest today is David W. Cameron, an Australian who's uh, historian and author whose research has taken him all around the world, archaeology as well as kind of conventional history. This is one of his books. This is the one we're talking about today, Kokoda Plateau. There's a whole raft of books. They're sometimes a bit tricky to find outside of Australia, but you can usually find them as Kindles or eBooks. but there are links below to the, the one we're talking about today. But I'm going to bring my guest in, David. So uh, good evening where you are. Good morning, Ram. How are you today? Hi, Paul. How are you? Um, apart from this, this nagging cough I can't get rid of, I'm, I'm fine. So um, we were just talking before going live about yep. the, the New Guinea campaign, the Guadalcanal campaign, because one thing I've learned over this two years, three years of doing this channel is that the, the separation of Guadalcanal and New Guinea is is not something the Japanese ever did. The Japanese pretty much treated that whole area as one big campaign and some of the same commanders were involved in both. But it's Western um, writing about it has rather separated it. So Americans talking about Guadalcanal, Australians talking about New Guinea. So before we bring up your PowerPoint and to talk about what you do, what you're obviously part of this kind of new guard of trying to look at this campaign from a more worldly view and and, and my first question is what, why you should be looking at it from a worldly view well i'll touch upon it on in a slideshow um you can't separate new guinea and the solomons um i'll talk about the japanese southern resource zone which was to be established basically from new guinea all the way to fiji new new, new Caledonia. it was basically Papua new guinea solomons new Caledonia to fiji and we'll talk about why that didn't eventuate but um that in their, their link now the, the campaigns the Australians and the Americans fought together to, to, to defeat the Japanese and uh, well, Americans and, and Solomons and initially the Australians and the Kokoda track they were weren't designed as one campaign but as you said they are, they are linked you cannot separate the events of the quarter canal from what was happening in Papua um the Japanese were trying to defend uh, define a defensive barrier which was called the southern resource zone and they are intricately linked Hmm. Um, and I think Australians and the Americans finally realised at some point that they were fighting a, one campaign, the Marines on Guadalcanal and the Australians at, at uh, Kokoda, uh, to stop this buffer zone being formed. And you really can't think about one without the other. Um, and like in my books, I, I'm, I go about what was happening. Not a lot of de any detail about Guadalcanal, but reminding people, hey, this is happening at Guadalcanal as well. So you've got to look at these two places together because you really shouldn't separate the two. Even though they weren't designed as one campaign, they actually were a campaign in the end of it. Once yeah, and, and it also is we, we, we don't want to get stuck in it. I've got, I'm saying rabbit hole early so people can have a drink if they want to, but we don't want to get too caught up in it. But the, the yep. naval aspect particularly involves yep. everybody, and the Dutch, of course, always get yep. written out of everybody's stories. The Dutch oh, yeah. is important in that yep. part of the world. But you know, I'm, I'm beginning to realise now how that campaign or the campaigns there, you cannot separate them, as, as Indy Nidell says on his big channel, you know, nothing happens in a vacuum. So yep. we have been presented history a lot over the years from the vacuum of British write about British history for the Brits, Americans about Americans, Americans and Australians the same. And it's important to embrace more of a international way of looking at it. But anyway, we've, you've come armed with a PowerPoint, which will take you through. Again, folks, the links to the book are in the description below. I don't think you'll have many questions about the minute of the battle, because I think David's going to be covering it as we go along. It's going to be a pretty long and pretty detailed presentation, this. But of course, if you do have questions, fire away and we'll address them as we go. Any kind of bigger ones about the New Guinea campaign broadly or Australian forces, we can kind of deal with them perhaps at the end. But at the moment, I'm going to hand over to David. Just tell me when we move on the slides and we'll we'll, we'll look at this um, this interesting campaign. Yeah, um, as an archaeologist, I tend to go into detail and I go into chronology. So um, this is going to be an in-depth um, review of what happened in the first four weeks of the Kota campaign. This is before the Japanese and Australians moved into the highlands. Most of this is dealing with what was happening on the northern lower plains before the actual Kokoda campaign started officially in the highlands of the Owen Stanleys. And I've written four books on the whole campaign. This is obviously I, I started this when I started writing this book. It was supposed to be one or two chapters of a book on Usarava, which was a major battle in the um, in the Kokoda Plateau or in, in the Owen Stanley Range. 
And after I uh, started reviewing it, there's a whole book just on the first four weeks. So my one or two chapters, which was supposed to lead to um, the Battle of Usarava, ended up being its own book, um, which then led to ended up was supposed to be one book, ended up being four books. For or might as well cover the whole campaign. So um, yeah, uh, you should go to the next slide, please. Yep. Um, yeah, this is part one. There's there's five parts in all. This is preparations. This is before the Japanese invasion. I'll give a brief review of what was happening in the Gonabuna area at the northern um, coastal area of New Guinea before the Japanese invaded on the 21st of July in 1942. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the race to Gona. Uh, basically, the Australian militia, 14th and 30th Brigades, landed in Papua, New Guinea, with the Japanese entry into the war. Uh, by May 1942, basically had six militia battalions there. Um, by mid-1942, the Australian veterans of the um, 6th and 7th Divisions had fought gallantly in Syria, in Mediterranean, Greece, Crete and North Africa. They were back in Australia with Japan's entry into the war and they were training in Queensland to do battle with the Japanese in, in the jungle. So they'd been fighting in basically the desert of North Africa, fighting Rommel's Africa Corps find themselves in Australia in the tropical jungles of North Queensland trying to try come up to scratch fighting in jungles because they're about to be sent to Papua. Um, now, as I've touched on before, the Japanese uh, wanted to invade New Guinea, not to invade Australia. The Japanese had no real aims to invade Australia. There was just no way, given the, the, the large continent, that Japanese could invade New Australia with any chance of, of succeeding. Um, what they wanted to do, as I said before, was establish the Japanese South, uh, Southern Resource Zone, which was stuff from Queensland, up uh, from New Guinea, all the way to Fiji. And the Battle of the Coral Sea, which was supposed to be, uh, which was fought by um, uh, American, predominantly, and Australian forces, uh, Navy stopped um, the Japanese from invading Port Moresby. It was supposed to be an invasion, a seaborne invasion. Battle of the Coral Sea stopped that invasion. Japanese had to turn around and had to reconsider their options. Um, so they were still planning on establishing this long line of a buffer zone, which was to stop the, Jap the Allies forces from invading mainland Asia, including the Philippines. Um, there was going to establish a long line buffer zone. Uh, of course, then Midway happened. And that's the Japanese before that were planning to invade New Fiji and New Caledonia. Midway stopped the Japanese. I mean, they lost four carriers. There was no way that there was that they could now invade Fiji and New Caledonia. So the southern resource zone, which was supposed to be from New Guinea at one end to Fiji, suddenly became Papua and the Solomons. So much was much smaller zone, but it was still a key buffer zone to stop Allied bombers and Allied fleets and and invasion force from storming um, down the belly of the, what was then the Japanese Empire. Um, How by June, um, Allies. Intelligence had recorded that the Japanese were planning to invade Buna and Gona on the northern coast of New Guinea. Now, Buna was significant because there was an old airfield there. It wasn't a great airfield, but there was an airfield there, and the Japanese thought, well, we can establish an airfield there. And they also planned, given that that Milne Bay, uh, sorry, the, the Battle for Coal Sea had stopped the Japanese invasion, they thought, well, maybe we can attack Port Moresby from the northern coast because they knew there was a track which became famous for Australians and uh, um, as the Kokoda track. Mm. Um, so they had two main goals. That was to invade northern the northern coast around Papua and uh, sorry around Buna and Gona, to establish an airfield, and they also to do a reconnaissance in strength, take the, the Kokoda airstrip about fifty miles inland. Kokoda was based right at the um, edge of the northern escarpment of the Owen Stanley Range, but there was an airfield there. So the Japanese wanted to capture that airfield, but they also wanted to send a reconnaissance in detail up into the Mike Mountains and go up to Usarava and then return. The aim being that the initial force would determine whether it was feasible, could they actually conduct operate land operations against Port Moresby from the north? As we'll see, they suddenly, this um, reconnaissance ended up being a major invasion um, towards Port Moresby. Um, so basically the race, uh, mind, mind you at the same time, MacArthur and Blamey had decided they wanted to build airfields in Buna area. So basically, by June, late June, you've got this race on between the, the Australians and the Americans to build um, air bases around the Buna area, and you've got the Japanese wanting to do the same. So uh, the, the scene is set for um, Allied and Japanese confrontation in northern Papua around about July 1942. Next slide, please. Yep. Captain Sam Templeton. Uh, who's um, pretty much a, a hero of the Kokoda campaign and the men of B Company, 39th Battalion, 
Um, Sam Templeton was a 41-year-old. Um, the men called him Uncle Sam. He was very much a father figure. And he was the only um, officer of the 39th Battalion um, who was a militia officer. By um, June, all of the all of the um, company commanders had been replaced by second AIF officers. These were men who had fought in the Mediterranean against Wamal and uh, sorry, in, in North Africa against Wamal. Uh, they came back. They replaced a lot of the militia officers. Sam Templeton was the only officer who remained in in 49th Battalion as a militia officer. All the others were replaced by by AIF officers, and it was a good thing because he was a perfect man, right time, right place. Sam Templeton was ideal for what was about to happen um so uh the, the company um had a lot of outstanding ncos some of them were second aif officers uh, there, there were in australia there was two main forces there was a militia and there was a second aif second aif were allowed to go overseas um militia were basically that they, they can only defend australian in defense and australian territories and that was written in the parliamentary law new guinea happened to be an australian province so while the men of the second IF were fighting in Africa and whatnot, the militia was sent to New Guinea with the Japanese entering the war because New Guinea was part of an Australian protectorate, so they could go. Um, so um, uh, the men crossed the Yale and Stanleys in in uh, early July in Camp, um, B Company um, in order to establish a base for the ultimate Allied troops that would go in to establish the air bases and um, try and beat the Japanese. Um, Lieutenant um, Goff Judy Garland, who was Templeton's 10 platoon commander, recalled um, Sam Templeton at the time. He said, he set an example to the whole of this company in order, in other words, I think he realised that we were a lot of young blokes, a man that you couldn't get to know very well, but he always said that if he went into action against the Japs, he wouldn't come back. And that's exactly what happened. Next slide, please. So now we've got the Japanese... Um, Major General Hori Tomatiro and the South Seas Force. This was the force that was to invade, originally to invade the um, northern coast of Papua, do a reconnaissance of the Kokoda track, and if feasible, then launch a major operation to take Kokoda from, from the north, uh, so take Port Moresby from the north. Major um, General Hori commanded the South Seas Force, consisting primarily of the 144th and the 41st regiments. These men were veterans of the fighting to take New Guinea and New Britain. Um, some were likely involved in the massacre of Australian POWs of Lark Force in the Toll Plantation. Yeah. Um, these troops, uh, about 150 Australians, were captured um, in, in New Britain and um, taken lots down lots of freeze and bayoneted to death. About eight men survived to tell the tale, and some of the men of the 144th Regiment were involved in that massacre. Colonel uh, Yakiyomo Yasuki was commander of the 1st Independent Engineer Regiment, commanded the initial invasion force known as Yukiyama at Lance Butai. Uh, about 4,000 men would, ultimately there'd be about 13,000 Japanese land there, but there'd be about 4,000 that would land as an initial invasion force. Um, Yakiyama um, would take command of the South Seas Force until Hori arrived in mid-August, um, and um, he was in command of establishing not just the airfield, but also getting troops to capture um, the Kokoda airstrip and then advance, make an initial reconnaissance of the Kokoda track to see whether it's feasible to launch an attack. Um, the remaining 3,000 troops were to establish the airfield. So you basically had 4,000 troops, 4,000 troops, roughly 1,000 to 1,500 were to combat troops to go forward, uh, take Kokoda and um, do a reconnaissance. And the other remaining 3,000 or so troops were building up the airfields that were to be established at Buna and conducting beachhead defences. Just please. a quick question for you, David, because yeah. it often comes up when people are writing about this is that the Japanese troops were excellent jungle fighters, or they, it, it's kind of that trope that gets um, that gets repeated. Not true. Where, uh, where are you on that? <laughs> they weren't. I mean, uh, where in Japan do you have jungle? Where in exactly. China yeah. do you yeah. have jungle? Um, people, yeah, that's very true. A lot of people, oh, they were excellent jungle fighters. They were new to the jungle just as much as the Australians, mm. the Americans, and the Brit were in Burma. Um, they were great fighters, but they jungle fighting did not come naturally to the Japanese because, yeah. Um, when they came in the South Pacific, it was just as new to them as it was to everybody else. So, um, yeah, they were great fighters, but they weren't natural jungle fighters. Yes, it's just one of those things that annoys me a bit. I don't quite know where it started, this idea. I mean, maybe as a kid, it's the comic books. Part, partly yeah, the, Commando the, Comics, maybe, yeah. Commando Comics, the Japanese were the ones who used the jungle as the best, and the British always out there being pale-skinned and not getting on very well. But, yeah, it's interesting how often it gets repeated, though, this skilled jungle fighters thing, and even some very kind of academic papers and books. And I just wonder where what basis there is. And it's interesting that you, you kind of say there isn't one, really. 
There isn't. And um, but they did actually, unlike the Australians, they did dye their, their uniforms jungle green. When the Australian, like the 49th Battalion, went in Kharki, which was like a desert uniform in, in, yep. the, in the jungle, it stands out like dog's balls. Excuse my French. Uh, but the Japanese <laughs> did actually have jungle greens and they did actually do well camouflage with vegetation and everything else. Um, but they weren't trained, naturally trained. Um, right. So to, to fight in the jungle. Um, so, uh, you know, the. Um, Next slide, please. Yeah, and just we've yeah, got a question now, quickly from Ernest Manley. A quick question: Basil Morris was commanding in Eighth Military District for four months. Does David have a view on why he had never explored mapped laid-in supply dumps along the trail south to north? Morris actually wanted. Uh, he didn't want to advance troops across the mountains. Morris actually wanted, and rightfully so, was a great strategist. Was in, in that sense, he wanted the Japanese to come to him if they landed. He did not want to have troops on the other side of the mountains because. Imagine trying to keep logistically supply a couple of Australian battalions on the north side of the track when all he, all he had was two, two transport aircraft, and he had one track. So Morris argued, look, if the Japanese are stupid enough to invade Papua New Guinea, around Gona, and they'd already invaded Papua, they were already in Salamoa and, and, um, uh, and, and they were at Ley, so they'd already further further west side invited. But if they really wanted to in, try and take Port Moresby, from the coast around Gana and Buna, he welcomed them to advance across the mountains because he wanted to keep his force at New Guinea so the Japanese would be strangled by supplies rather than his own force being strangled by supplies. Troops were sent over the mountains, as we're about to talk about, to do reconnaissance, and, and particularly because they wanted to establish the airfields. The men of Watson's 1st Infantry Bat uh, Patrick Battalion, they went over a month before the Japanese um, invaded. To, to generate, um, to try and get maps. and Because there were no maps, you know, the Kokoda track at the time, which I'll talk about, <clears throat> there was no map. You basically measured a distance in terms of hours. So they'd say, you want to get to point A to point B, and they didn't show you a map. They just said, it's going to take an hour and a half to get to here to there. It's going to take three hours to get from that village to the next village. So that's so it was basically a line with hours written on it, not a topographical map, showing the mountains and the gullies and another mountain and another huge ravine. and so. Um, and I'll, I'll get on to that. But the first um, Papua New Guinea battalion was commanded by Major William Watson, a 55-year-old gold, mi gold miner who was a heavily decorated veteran of the first Australian infantry, at uh, the first IIF before it on the in the Great War. PRB uh, was raised in 1940. By July 1942, um, it numbered a grand total of six Australian officers, a similar number of Australian and Papuan NCOs, and 105 men, uh, Papuan riflemen. Um, initially consisted of three companies, which means if you've got 105 men, the three companies are basically three platoons. Um, in February 1942, a company, the first PIB led by Captain um, Harold Jesser, crossed the Owen Stanley using the Kokoda track to conduct, to conduct controls around Gona and Buna. Um, in late June, Major Watson and C Company crossed the mountains to join his men of A Company because they were aware that the Japanese were thinking about landing in the area, so they wanted to get these men over there to do some reconnaissance. Um, meanwhile, Lieutenant Arthur Smith with um, B Company would also go over at the same time, but he would go further north um, around the Ambusi area. So you had three companies, or what's essentially three platoons, of the 1st PIB, 1st Infantry Battalion, around the Gona area before the Japanese um, launched their operation invasion. Next slide, please. Okay, you also got the Australian New Guinea Administrative um, Unit, which is Angau. For short, ANGO was a military-run government in Papua, formed shortly after the Japanese um, entered the war, Second World War. It was basically a military government. Um, not only was in charge of the first uh, infantry battalion, Papua Infantry Battalion, and, and um, the Royal Papua Infantry, which would end up fighting with the PIB, um, but it was also responsible for um, recruiting Papua carriers, which became famous in the war as, as carrying troops. Main thing is. The first troops that confronted the Japanese were not Australian. They were met these guys. They were these guys, the first Papuan Infantry Battalion. The first um, battle or outbreak of fighting between Allied and Japanese forces on the Kokoda campaign were troops of the first Papuan Infantry Battalion. Um, so that's often been over overlooked. Um, so it was not only Papuans weren't only carriers, they were actually fighters. They were they had their 303s and they were fighting with the Australians. Um, two heroes of the campaign, which became really well known 
uh, was uh, Lieutenant Burke Council was a 37 year old planner from Yoda Valley near Kokoda Station. He was 61 and he, he and 61 year old um, Great War veteran physician Doc Vernon. Um, Doc Vernon was responsible for maintaining the health of not only the troops in the initial stages of the fighting, but also the carriers who would eventually be critical in getting supplies and ammunition along the Kokoda track. Why Burke Council was responsible for organizing the track and organizing logistics. So these two men were critical. Very few individuals have had such importance as these two guys. Um, uh, most European civilians at the start of the war with, with Japan, they were evacuated from the northern coast of Papua and they were sent back to Australia. You weren't even allowed in Australia, you weren't even allowed to go to um, Australians, you weren't even allowed to go fly to Papua with the Japanese entry in the war. So, uh, but a number of um, missionaries decided not not to go. They stayed, but most civilians they were ordered to clear out, and they did. But um, a lot of the missionaries refused to go. And that, thank you. Leave it on this slide. So now we'll talk about the Gona mission. Um, the Anglo mission at Gona is situated, as you can see, the arrows pointing right on the coastline. This is where the Japanese are going to land on the the twenty first of July. Um, the head of the mission was um, Father James Benson, aged fifty seven, a Yorkshireman. Uh, he suffered two main or at least known two main tragedies in his life tragedies in his life in around about 1945 36 he was in australia he was um a, a, a missionary he was a missionary in australia uh, at bigo and he was crossing the clyde river and the clyde river at the time didn't have a bridge and there was a light when the ferry would arrive there'd be a light so late at night he's driving his car sees the light he drives down to the river thinking the fer the ferry's there for him plunges straight into the river his wife and four children drown he alone survives he then no, obviously decimated he, he ends up going to mission a year later um he's going to be the only guy out of the missionaries on this side of papua facing japanese that will survive another tragedy um he's the only survivor um so and also at gona we've got sister may Heyman from south australia age 36 she was a station nurse and she, her fiance was uh, father vivian retlich she was at sangara mission if you can see in the middle of the map sangara the inland mission he was a head of mission there. Um, our sister, Ma Mavis Parkinson from Queensland, she was age 26. Um, she was the head teacher there and she was engaged with an Australian army officer in Port Moresby at the time. Australian soldiers and uh, patrol officers and coast watchers just before the Japanese arrived loved Gona. It was a, they, they considered it a bit of a Australia, Australiana in the middle of nowhere um, with great lawns, it had a beach, um, even had a cricket pitch. And the, the, the guys loved being there. Um, and it was a bit of a little Australiana in the middle of New Guinea or the northern coast of New Guinea. Um, Benson tried to get May, May and, and Mavis to, to leave New Guinea, and at one point he succeeded. He got them to pack up just before the Japanese arrived in, in, and went up to, and told them to get onto the plane at um, Kokoda Station and clear out. They got halfway there and they turned around and said, no, we can't leave. They went back to the Gona mission and Father Benson was really devastated because he thought, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about the women. The, 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 these, the, they're off, but they wouldn't leave, so they stayed there. Next slide, please. Here we have a topo map of the Kokoda track. Um, now, the track was not designed as a single track. Originally, the track was developed. Each village would have its own track, obviously, because you'd have mountain ranges, and each village would normally be on a mountain plateau for defence reasons, defend them from other, other tribal groups. And um, each group was responsible for its own track. But eventually these tracks that were individual, they all ultimately joined up to make one track. They weren't designed as such, but because you know, one village would be on one mountain range and would be responsible for the track going down either side of it, would link up with the next village on the other planet. So basically you had this track that wasn't designed as such, but, but actually became a single track. And most of the people that walk the track today think they're walking the wartime track and they're not. Um, the track over time moves around, slash and burn agriculture, a village will be in one area for a couple of years, it'll exhaust the soil and then they'll have to move. And when they move, the track moves. So a lot of people who walk the track today, they're walking maybe 60, 50% of the wartime track. The other 40, 50% of the track is brand new because the villages right. move, the track moves as well. Um, and David Cancel, who was based at Kokoda in Yoda Valley, he um, very few people walk the track. And the only people that walked the track were Australian patrol officers who might walk parts of the track because they were responsible for different villages. They might walk part of the track. No one really walked the whole length of the track till um, very few did until the war 
war started and uh, Burke Kensal was one of the first to go from Kokoda all the way back to to Port Moresby. Now he'd been living in um, Yoda since 1927 and the first time he actually walked across was in 1942. And um, before then he would either catch a plane from Kokoda and land at Port Moresby or he'd go to Gona and catch a boat and go all the way to Port Moresby. So this whole track was brand new. No one ever knew about it. There wasn't a map. As I said before, you basically dictated how to get from point A to point B by hours, not by a top A map. Um, the first across the first military force was the small force to cross it was, as I said before, was Captain Jester and his men of aid company, the first um, Papua New Guinea battalion who crossed over in February, soon followed by the other three companies, which were basically platoons. Um, the first significant military force, if you want to call it significant, was um, Templeton and B Company that moved out of Port Moresby in uh, on the 7th of July to get to Gona. Uh, um, so they were the first significant military force to cross the Kokoda track. If you, next slide, please. They left on the 7th of um, July. Uh, Lieutenant Burke Council was accompanying Port um, uh, Captain Sam Templeton and his 120 men of B company as they crossed the track. Here's an idea of some of the terrain. Um, Corporal Reginald Markham, who was with Lieutenant Arthur Judy Garland's Templeton, recalled his, what he said when crossing the track. It was not very long before he realised just how tough the going was. Hours of climbing and hours of descending, inclines that never seemed to end, steep downgrades which made even strong limbed men tremble at the knees. At first they were apt to try and see what was ahead, groaning when steep pinches came into view. But it was not very long before the only object which seemed to attract their gaze was the heel of the fellow in front of them. Those who were talkative became silent and only laboured breathing and occasional grunts punctuated the stillness of the thick jungle and scrub that bordered the track. And the track was basically one or two feet wide or about less than a metre. So they plodded on, clothes becoming wet, despite the moderately high altitude of 2,500 feet. On the damper, more slippery grades, the staves, the walking sticks, which were all instructed to find for themselves, were of great assistance. In fact, they confessed later that they um, were lost without them. Contrary to the general idea that some scenery was worth seeing, um, there was bugger all to see. Corporal Donald Daniels of A Company, who would soon follow B Company over the mountains, recalled, I was only one who knew how to work a Bren gun, so I had to teach one of my men how to fire it. We only got the Bren guns halfway across the track. They were still in Greece. We also considered the point three oh three Lee Enfield rifle a hindrance in the jungle fighting. My section had a Bren gun and I had a Thompson submachine gun. The rest of them had point three oh three rifles, huge things. They could fire to 700 yards away, but all you needed in the jungle was something you could fire to 30 yards. If point three oh three was, was oversized, it was a darn nuisance going through the jungle because you put it over your shoulder and it stuck up in the air 18 inches. You got caught up in the vines. It was a problem. Whereas a Thompson machine gun, you just tucked it under your arm. Short bursts of submachine gun fire. You could spray the whole area. Next slide, please. Wow. They ended up took them eight days to cross the mountains. And, and just presented right. without comment, I'm I'm liking the fact you're sticking rigidly to track and have never used the word trail once. We'll we'll draw a line under that now, but that is one of the big debates. But we'll we'll move along. <laughs> yeah, it's not important, but yeah. I, I prefer track. I've read all the diaries, the Italian diaries, and basically everyone calls it a track. But yeah. I can understand some people call it a trail. Okay, this is um going to beach. Um, the mission station is to your right. Uh, I suppose we were a point up there. This is where the Japanese landed on the uh, 21st of July, 1942. Uh, they had a mission. Um, Father Benson was repairing some chairs. And in the afternoon, one of these parishioners came running up saying, oh, ship, ship's offshore. So Father Benson run, ran to shore to find out what was going on. And um, what he saw, he estimated to be a cruiser, three destroyers and two large transports. He didn't know whether they were American, Australian or Japanese. He rushed back to the two sisters who were cook, um, who were cooking dinner and said, oh, come out and have a look. And they all ran down to the beach. At the time, there was also two coast watchers who were visiting them. They also ran down to the beach. So they're all sitting on, sitting on this beach wondering, are these Americans? Are they Australian? Japanese? Who are they? By 3 p.m., the warship starts showing the area. They suddenly realise, well, these are Japanese. And they start seeing troops boarding the barges heading for the beach. Uh, Benson recalled Hewitt and Palmer, these were the two coast watchers, rushed to the water's edge with their weapons to confront the invasion. Uh, there's two guys, and there's about 4,000 Japanese about to land. Benson pleaded with them not to fire to avoid innocent bloodshed. Later writing, I admired their coolness on that day, standing alone in face of a whole hostile enemy. Uh, the two men, 
uh, decided, they agreed that this was probably not a wise decision. It was probably going to result in villagers being killed. So they headed off to Boona, where they, there was an Australian government station. And Australian troops were there, um, other case watchers. Uh, Benson, Mavis and May then quickly ran back to the station, realised the Japanese were about to, to invade and got shells going off in this, this very scenic area. If you can go to the next slide. Um, this is this is a photograph of I just couldn't find a photograph of Boona before the invasion. This was taken a few days later, and you can see um, the bomb blasts going on your left. They're, they're bombs exploding, but you can see that this was the um, the Boona station a few days after uh, after the invasion. And here we have the um, Benson, Mavis, and May, and uh, we've got the Japanese transports and the Japanese Marines and the, the commander of the. Um, 144th Battalion, uh, one, one, first Battalion, 144th Regiment. Um, within minutes of, the, of the, them clearing out, the Japanese start to arrive at the mission station. Um, Lieutenant Ida and his men arrive. He noticed cups were still half warm of warm, were still half full of warm tea. He yelled to his men, "They're not far. Look for them." Then the phone rings, which is probably Boona Station, and all he hears is, "Get out! Get out!" Then phone cuts dead. This is probably some Australians at Boona who saw the bombing out, the bombing. Um, meanwhile, Lieutenant Takashimi Toshinghi and Number 2 Company 144th Regiment was landing inland to capture Kokoda Airstrip. They land, they're immediately heading inland. They've got to capture Kokoda Plateau, uh, so they're not waiting. Um, not long after taking a small path off the main track, the, the, the um, Father um, Benson and the missionary women, they go off, to, it's getting dark. They've just escaped. That darkness is descending. They find a small path. They go off the path and they set up a camp in a small garden area. However, half an hour later, not long after taking the small path off the track for the night, they see flashlights along the main track and hear, hear the Japanese. They, the Japanese miss the small path that they had taken and continue on to Sangara mission. Mavis, in a letter to her mother, wrote, It gave us rather a horrible feeling having them so near, and we stood there expecting to see them come up our path every minute and to get a bayonet or bullet in, bullet in the ribs. Uh, Mavis and May would write um, a number of very long letters during their four weeks trying to escape the Japanese, uh, which I was able to see at the Australian, they preserved in the Australian War Memorial, and we'll mm -hmm. go on to how they ended up there. But there's long letters and for four, four weeks talking about them trying to escape the Japanese. They're truly remarkable documents and actually holding the, the documents in there with the pen, wow. oh, sorry, with the pencil. It's, it's Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, next slide, please. So at the same time that the Japanese are landing at Gona at Boona, not far away, we've got um, a number of coast watchers. Um, a beach patrol by the 1st uh, Papua Infantry Battalion reported to tell Alan um, Champion, who was at Boona Station, and that was his station, he was commander of the radio. Um, they said just before the Japanese started shouting, oh, there's clouds off, off at Gona. So Champion runs down with his binoculars to find out what's going on, and then he hears the explosions of the um, naval shells exploding around Gona. And he, he can see the Japanese landing. He immediately runs back to Boona Station, starts burning the ciphers. He starts any secret documents he's um, destroying. And when, meanwhile, his um, fellow uh, Coast Watchers on the radio to Port Moresby saying the Japanese are invading um, doesn't get through. There's no response. Um, so he's um, madly destroying the, the ciphers. And all of a sudden, reports come in that there are Japanese of the 5th um, Special Naval Landing Party, which are the Japanese Marines. They're landing nearby. Off of Boona to capture the station. He destroys the radio, and just as he destroys the radio, he he and the others head out, and a flight of um, Japanese bombers come over, and they just bomb the hell out of Boona Station. They get out just in time. Meanwhile, to the east at Oro Bay, Father Vivian Ritledge, who's in charge of the Sangara mission, the inland mission, he's arriving back at Oro Bay. He'd been sick, and that very day, he arrives just as Japanese a few kilometres to the west are invading. He sees what's happening. He knows what's happening. He gets off the boat. He tells the lugger, the, the, like the small boat, to clear out, and he heads inland to warn Sangawa Mission what's happening. Um, meanwhile, um, at Alawa, which is about 20, 30 kilometres inland, you've got Sam Templeton is with Captain Thomas um, Graham Slaw with Angau. Both hear a distant rumbling along the coast, but they put it down to thunder. They think, oh, it's just a tropical thunderstorm. Soon after, Graham School radio operator hears um, Champion's message to, to Morsby. This is a message that doesn't get through, and he hears that the Japanese are landing. Templeton immediately radios Kokoda, where his troops are based at, because he'd been at Boona that, that, uh, that morning to find out about supplies. He radios Kokoda and says, hey, Japs are landing, Japanese are landing, um, and orders him to contact. His radio can't contact Morsby, but he, he relays a message, tells Kokoda um, radio 
contact more has been telling what's going on and the message gets through from Kokoda. Hours later, Corporal Francis Chattavita with the first PIB, he's on a patrol, unaware of the Japanese invasion. Meanwhile, Port Moresby hears of the invasion and they launch B-25 bombers out. 25, they're only 25 minutes away from um, going to beach. So um, uh, Chitavetta is, is with his men. He reaches the beach, unaware of the invasion. All of a sudden he sees these B-26, B-25 bombers flying in and they start bombing just as dust comes in, the Japanese invasion, the, the convoy. And um, they hit the Yatsusan Maru, but don't hit anything else. Um, he, he takes one bomb in the, in the cargo hold. Next slide, please. So next day, um, the Japanese are establishing themselves. The Japanese are in red. Australian troops are, and Papuan troops are in blue. Um, down in, in Bogo, as you'll see, uh, there's a little greenish tag. That's um, where uh, Father Vivian, that's where he is. The other green up... Um, dark green up near the red, that's the Gona mission, that's roughly where they are to spent the night, and the yellow is the Sangara mission um, people, uh, uh, so this is, this is the day after the invasion um, most people know about the invasion, but Sangara don't know so um, several quiet allied bombings target the Japanese convoy at Gona, again hitting already struck Ayatsu Maru it is, it's now forced to run aground, it becomes famous as the Gona wreck and it'll yep. be used for the whole four months for as a landing pier, basically, for Japanese. In one of these attacks, American pilot Lieutenant David Hunter the, in his B-39 fighter flew low and struck the Japanese in their landing barges because they were still landing troops. But his plane was hit and he crashed into the sea and he swam ashore to be welcomed by the Japanese. He soon sent through a bow, interrogated and beheaded. The Ghana party all that day hear the Allied sorties. All that day there's, there's Australian, American fighters and bombers targeting the Ghana um, beachhead. Um, May, May, in a letter that day, writes in a, in a letter to her sister, that, um, Viola, Viola, who lives in Canberra, she writes, as we expected, not long after dawn, overcame the plane, such bombing and shooting, 19 rain, raids we counted that day, nothing could possibly be left to our love, love, nothing could possibly be left of our lovely station. On we pushed, not seeing anything, but hearing more, and enough to tell us that havoc, which was being caused by Australian and American bombers. Japanese anti-aircraft, um, anti-aircraft, their fighters, etc., are attacking our planes. Many a time we crouched between the sheltering flanges of a huge tree, whilst dogfights took place practically above our heads. The earth trembled when the biggest bombs fell. Our planes crashed. On we sped, using, now this is our biggest piece of good fortune to date, a compass which had been given to father not so many weeks ago by an American airman who had crashed nearby and had landed, uh, parachuted successfully. Benson decides that the safest option is to head northwest towards Soya, which is a village way up, as you'll see up, up um, on top of the map. Now, that's where they head for, that's where they reach. If they'd stay there, they would have been safe. But as we'll see, things were mm -hmm. not to... So, next slide, please. So, now we're at the Singaro Mission Station. They're oblivious to the invasion. Um, Lieutenant... Um, oh, sorry, can you go back? Slide 15? Yep. So we're still at second, 22nd of July. Um, Lieutenant Bill uh, um, Owen, commanding for a 9th Battalion, who's at Port Moresby, his B Battalion's Templeton is over here. He's now, uh, other three companies are ordered to get over to Dakota quick. He's got to cross the mountains. So that day, C Company immediately leaves Port Moresby and on foot and starts heading over the Dakota Plateau. Meanwhile, on the other side of the mountain, um, Major Watson and Captain Jessa and their men of the Papua Infantry Battalion make their way to Awala. Awala, you'll see Awala there in the, the middle of the map. They're tasked with trying to slow down the Japanese. Captain Graham uh, Grandslaw advanced to Isigahambo to warn Warrant Officer Bitmead with Ango to evacuate a native field hospital. He's looking after the native um, who are sick, and he's got about 30 patients there. Bitmead requested that he remain to supervise the evacuation of his patients, which is approved. However, Bitmead then decides to go and warn Sagawa Mission Station of the Japanese invasion. Graham Slaw, Lieutenant Richard McKenna, and Warrant Officer Yeoman from Ango, accompanied by two policemen from the Royal um, Papua New Guinea advanced to conduct a recce around Popendera, which you'll see is the second red uh, point where the Japanese are. Uh, however, they, they're ambushed. Graham Slaw and McKenna uh, disappear in the jungle. The, the other three guys make it back to Walla, but Graham Slaw and McKenna get separated and they become lost in the jungle. Uh, meanwhile, Francis uh, Chitaveta, who'd seen the bombing the previous day in his section of the first Papua New Guinea, they approach Sangara, uh, but observe Japanese along the track. Uh, 
He then reaches Awala and informs Watson that the Japanese are approaching Sangara. Uh, Watson ordered several patrols to be conducted in, in and around Sangara area to find out what's going on. Um, Captain Jess, with around 30 men, passed through Isakam Bogo. That's where the field hospital is. Uh, Beatmeat, having returned from Sangara, informs them that Gamslaw had passed through and returned. So the Japanese are approaching and occupying Sangara. The Sangara mission has been told earlier by Bitmead, clear out the Japanese have landed, and that that with that yellow spot is, is a veto where they, they'll end up hiding for about a week. On approach Sangara, Jesse hears a motorbike, and in the village they observe the Japanese, and he reports back to um, Watson, the Japanese have now taken Sangara. Next slide, please. Now this is the Sangara mission. Um, they're stationed with Reverend Vivian Rittlich, who's um, just landed, and he's trying to get his way to Sangara to warn him of the Japanese invasion because um, he arrived in Aro Bay the day before. Um, at the inland mission station, at Sister Marjorie Benchley, aged mid-20s, the mission's nurse from Lisbon. There's 47-year-old Sister Lila Lushmore, the mission teacher from Ganguru Island in South Australia, and Papuan teacher evangelist, 27-year-old Lucian Tapiedi. Nearby to the southwest is the Zavita mission station, headed by Reverend Henry Holland and lay preacher John DeFill. That um, that's just uh, near Sangara. Um, they'll remain hidden close to Isavita as they will soon realise that they're trapped behind the Japanese lines. Later that day, Bitme, who was east of Sangara, searching for food for his patients, is captured by the Japanese. Um, so um, he recalls to Doc, he, he'll survive, he recalls to Doc Vernon of his experience. While in the hands of the Japanese, he suffered great indignities and was in the constant danger of being shot. Time after time, he told me later, a squad leveled their rifles at me and clicked the triggers, but the barrels were unloaded and his imminent death postponed. Their object in this was probably to get him in the right state of questioning and, all probability, they were waiting for the arrival of one of their officers who could speak English. His ordeal ended in utter, utter loss of consciousness. They beat him to a pulp. Next slide, please. Just a quick question for you, David. I know you were, I'm going back in time a little bit, but places yep. like the Sangara mission, would they have had set up before the Japanese invasion any kind of protocol about like air raid shelters or supplies hidden in the jungle or, or, or rendezvous places, or was it all just react when it happened? That's a good question. I, I can't honestly tell you. I, I think it's probably the latter. I think it was they weren't planning. They never thought the Japanese would land there, and it was... Um, like I said, the, the women were supposed to have been cleared out. They, um, yeah. Actually, the bishop in New Guinea encouraged missionaries to stay there against the Australian government, which was you know, later on was criticised. So um, the bishop encouraged the, the women and the, and the missionaries to stay there. Um, I don't think they had it. They, they weren't prepared. Right. Um, okay. So on the, so on the 23rd, that's two days into the invasion, early morning, Lieutenant Colonel Chalk with the uh, Papua New Guinea Battalion, uh, they were ordered to burn the hospital at Izagambu, Izagambu, and destroy all supplies before falling back to Hagen Hambo to set up an ambush for the Japanese. So the Japanese are advancing towards um, Hagen Hambo. Um, a few hours later, Chalk at Hagen Hambo was reinforced with Lieutenant Wart, and he's been in the first PIB, and all his force now totaled around 35 men, including Corporal Chuva Veda and his section. This is the guy that had seen the bombing previously. Um, now, he's uh, Chuva Veda is now stationed just forward of... Um, Hagen Hambo uh, and the company's men are, are, are scouts waiting for the Japanese because there's an ambush position just behind them. They're the scouts. Chalk waited for the last. So he, um, Hagen, um, Chiveta, he sees the Japanese coming. He runs back and says, okay, get ready. The Japanese are coming. They're ready to swing the ambush. This is going to be the first confrontation between Allied forces and the Japanese. And the Allied force are Papuans, Australian officers, Australian NCOs and Papuan NCOs and Papuan riflemen. So this is the first contact with, with the Japanese. Chalk waited the last minute before springing his ambush. The lead element stumbled and fell, but this was quickly followed by concentrated enemy rifle and machine gun fire, followed by mortar bombs. Chalk and his men fell back, as ordered. Chinovetta recalled, we only had rifles, and we opened fire on the Japs, and they scattered everywhere, and when they returned our fire, we retreated. Meanwhile, by 11 p.m., Lieutenant Arthur C. Camp, leading 11, platoon of, that's 11 platoon of the 39th Battalion, Arrived at Oala, Watson ordered the Australians to hold the position until Chalk and his men passed through to take up a position at Ogan Hambo, 12 kilometres west, which you can see on the map there. Um, after Chalk and his men passed through, Sea Camp and his men crossed the Kamusi River, taking up a position at Wairopi. 
having established their ambush position by 6.30 p.m. So the Papuan troops and Australians now falling back, doing a delayed um, action. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Colonel Bill Owen, commanding the 49th Battalion, was frustrated. He was trying to fly out, expecting to fly out to Dakota that afternoon, um, but his plane doesn't arrive, so he's delayed for another 24 hours. Next slide, please. So, Lieutenant C. Colonel and Platoon, next morning, they're um, basically waiting on the opposite bank of the river for the Japanese to cross the Kamusi River. At 9 a.m., they received word from Templeton, who was now at Kokoda, that around 2,000 Japanese had landed at Gona. It was actually 4,000, but most of them will not go inland. They're, they're going to stay at Muna to establish the airfield. Um, he ordered Sea Camp to conduct a rear action only. He states, no do or die stunts, close back on Kokoda. Um, you've got about 100, less than 100 men, and you've got roughly three, 300, 350 Japanese at, at, at um, you can see at Wairopi on the map, the two blue and the two red, they've confronted each other on the, on the river. Uh, so Australians and patterns aren't numbered three to one. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Harry Mortimer and Templeton are about seven kilometres west of Garari. You can see the next blue, Garari, that's where Templeton are located, about 30 men. At around 2.30 p.m., lead elements of the 1st Battalion, 144th Regiment, reached the eastern bank of the river. As they attempted to cross using rubber, rubber boats, the ambush was sprung. The enemy responded with heavy machine gun fire, mortar fire, and the main Japanese element moved north to flank sequence position. The Japanese are great at flanking, so one force tries to cross the river. Meanwhile, the bulk of the force are going north to try and flank them. Sergeant Major Dawson, he's a uh, sergeant major and he's age 21. Uh, he recalled um, being on the other side of the river. A runner slivered up through the undergrowth and by way of greeting said, what's the state of your underpants, Sarge? Before I had a chance to reply, he went on to say that Captain Stevenson, who's a um, 2IC of the of the of B Company, he wanted to say that Captain Stevenson wanted the company headquarters to move back and join 12 platoon at Garari. So um, they had to fall back to Garari, which is a, on the, you see the blue point there. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Bill Owen, commanding the battalion, he finally um, boards a, a Royal Australian Air Force Lockheed Hudson bomber, makes a 20-minute flight to Kokoda. Within an hour of landing um, at Kokoda, him and Owen and Templeton are making their way to Garari to assess the situation. They arrived there at 2 a.m. in the morning. Uh, meanwhile, Captain Graham Straw had made his way towards, he's the guy that um, had gone out and was ambushed right. um, round about Papandetta. He and, and, and McKenna were lost. Um, Graham Straw has made his way to Papandetta, just near Papandetta. Um, and he finds out that McKenna is, is nearby, so he rushes to try and find McKenna. Next slide, please. Um, so we're three days into the invasion. Owen decides to make uh, sorry, four days invasion. Owen decides to make a stand 800 metres east of Garara, which you can see the blue and the red dots there. Yep. With Templeton now in command, Owen heads back to Kokoda to organise the arrival of the rest of the battalion. Owen is hoping that the rest of the battalion is going to arrive at air, by air on the airship of Kokoda, as you'll find out. That's not going to happen. Um, Major Watson sent out a patrols. One of these was led by Corporal George Meta, who reported a large Japanese force advancing on the main track towards Gagari. Within minutes, the Japanese fell into the Australian ambush, suffering 15 casualties. Two of the Japanese are killed. The Japanese respond with overwhelming fire, including mortars and mountain artillery. Now, the Japanese not only outnumber the Australians and the Papuan troops, but the Japanese, unlike the Australians, have medium machine guns, um, they have mortars, which Australians don't have, and they have artillery, a mountain, mountain artillery, which Australians don't have. Um, Templeton is now forced to fall back from Garari by 3 p.m. towards Oivy, um, which is just, as you'll see, to the um, to the left of Garari, right. the Garari. Um, and they've set up a locate, they, they've set up an ambush there that night. At Kokoda, on a quest, the urgent reinforcement who flown to him. The only response he received was from Kokoda, from Port Moresby. Reinforcements not available. Remember, tired Australians fight best. Now, his response went unrecorded and probably rightfully so. Later that day, Owen sent another message requesting that two companies be flown in Kokoda ASAP. He gets no response. Later that day, Owen, um, sorry, meanwhile, the Gona Missionary Party was finally approaching the safety of a sea of village. You see that green arrow way up north. They're finally reaching safety. If only they'd stayed there, they would have survived. Father Vivian Rettlich, meanwhile, is trying to get to Sangara, at Sangara and he finally gets there. Um, he has no idea of the whereabouts. He reaches there, but he's got no idea where his staff are, um, and he's got no idea where his fiance. His actually fiance is um, Mary Heyman, who's um, part right. of the Gana mission. 
he's wondering where they where everybody is but thankfully they've gone so he's hoping they've escaped to Kokoda which wasn't the case by now Graham had caught up with Kenner at uh, Siaparata village southeast of Sangara and they decided to make their way to Iropi by then that's held by the Japanese meanwhile Bettmead who'd been captured by the Japanese he manages to escape with the help of a local Papua and may have been one of his patients who he'd been treating helped him escape I mean, he makes his way to Sangara, where he meets Reverend Rutledge, who's looking for his staff. Um, some local Papuans then hide them away, not far from Sangara Station. Next slide, please. And just, just a quick question about communication. A couple of times you said no reply received. Yep. Are these due to personnel failures, equipment failures, range, uh, confusion, I or combination of everything? I would like to think that you got no response because uh, radio communication is pretty if, on and off. So it's highly likely they never received that. Um, communications are really bad. The radios are really, really appalling. One large ADWA um, radio will arrive with, arrive with Owen. But the main, fine, main line of communications is going to be a telephone cable yeah. that's ultimately stretched from Port Moresby all the way across the mountains. Radios are used, but they're not very effective. So they have, they're using one, eventually they're using one radio cable to, um, and with a number of relays along the way. To get communications back to Port Moresby, it's really outrageous what was going on. I mean, but that that was the times. So yeah, that's right. The radio communications were was hit and miss. So now we're um, five days into the invasion, and the first, this is going to be one of the first major attempts to stop the Japanese in their tracks. Um, so finally, it's agreed to fly out the next day. They did, they agreed to fly out D Company um, to reinforce Kokoda, hearing the Japanese are almost at Kokoda, um, they've stirred up an ounce nest, so they decide to do action. So um, on land, so finally, um, what, half of, of the platoon, 16 men, Lieutenant Doug McLean, they arrive by plane, they land, plane can carry 16 men at the most, so it's half a platoon arrive. These men at land at Kokoda, they immediately rushed to Oivy because um, Templeton and um, 11 and 12 platoon are making a stand at Oivy. They're rushed to try and reinforce them. Ivy Village is a small plateau protruding north from the Alan Stanley Range. And all Templeton with his two platoons and men of the 1st Papua Infantry Battalion, he's got around 90 men and he's facing around about 300 Japanese. A few hours later, McLean and his men arrive at Oivy and Templeton placed them in the perimeter. McLean told him that the rest of the platoon was just a few, hour, few hours behind. The other half of the platoon are going to arrive by plane about an hour after McLean landed. McLean landed. The Japanese troops of the 1st uh, Battalion, 144th Regiment, meanwhile, are advancing on Oivy. Later that day, outnumbering Templeton's Temple troops 3 to 1. Unlike the Australians, they have medium submachine guns, mortars, and heavy artillery, mountain artillery. By 4 pm, Captain Ogawa Tatsuo, leading number one company, launched his attack, supporting uh, sorted by elements of number five Special Naval Landing um, Party. Uh, close behind is Lieutenant Takashi Tunashi and number two company. So there were um, number one companies about to launch attack against OEV, followed by number two company, who's supported by a special naval landing party and there's also combat engineers. Concerned about the remaining men of 16th platoon, um, Templeton knows 16th, the other half of 16th platoon is coming down the track. Um, they're fighting at OEV. The Japanese are clearly starting to surround them. Both flanks are being being flanked by the Japanese. Templeton is worried about these guys, second half of 16th platoon, coming down from Kota to OEV, that they're going to be ambushed by the Japanese. He goes back alone to warn this platoon um, with the Japanese and to bring them in. All of a sudden, um, there's a lull in, in fighting, but they hear a rapid machine gun fire. And um, some men are concerned that um, machine gun fire is aimed at uh, Templeton. Clearly, the Japanese are now behind them. Some men go back to find Templeton, but he's never seen again. Um, the remaining men of 16th platoon um, realise that uh, they're cut off from Oivy because the Japanese are completely surrounded the position. Um, by nightfall, uh, it's clear that uh, Templeton is, is likely being killed. Uh, Watson um, is now in charge of position of Oivy. Uh, he's surrounded, uh, twenty percent casualties. He's, he's been he's got seventy percent casualties. Um, starting a major thunderstorm, and he decides he's got to get out. Luckily, there's one man from the Royal Papuan Constabulary who knows the area. He knows a way in a gorge. He says, "Look, I, I'll get you out through this gorge." So he gets them out at Oivy. They evacuate the plateau for a torrential rain. One soldier recalled as they marched south, recalled seizing a handful of phosphorescent fungus and was heard to tell his mates behind him, grab yourself some headlights, fellas. <laughs> Most by morning arrive at Taniki. Um, now, in 2009, a Japanese veteran of the campaign 
alleged that a short burst, that, that the short machine gun fire that was heard actually did hit Templeton. He was captured and taken to the medical officer, Lieutenant Colonel Yanagizawa Hiroshi, who was with the 15th Independent Engineer Regiment. He treats Templeton for his wounds. Uh, he's then taken to Lieutenant Colonel Zukamoto, commanding the 1st Battalion of the 144th Regiment for interrogation. Templeton provided no information other than to highly inflate the number of Australians facing the go to 1,000. He's now, there's now less than 100. Wow. Um, he also inflates the numbers of Australians at uh, Port Moresby to 80,000, when there's about 8,000. Um, he mocked Kosakamoto, stating, I wonder how many of you will see, see out today. I'll be counting. And he starts to laugh. This is an insult to um, the Japanese commander, whose face goes red, according to a witness. It is said that Tsukamoto's face turned bright red, and he was very angry, to the point that he drew his sword, killing Captain Sam Templeton, thrusting his sword into his stomach. Uh, next slide, please. Wow. So now we're going to talk about the first battle of Kokoda. Now we see here the blue is the plateau, that's Kokoda Plateau. The red is the Kokoda Station, where most of the buildings are. Most of the fighting is going to take it in that red area. The area in black is the runway, the airstrip, which remarkably will not come to any major use during the whole Kokoda campaign. Um, even though it's the focus of fighting, it's never really used by either side. Um, next slide, please. Is that because... Oh, sorry. It, um, sorry. Yep, if you can go back, you can see the the, 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 the start of the early to the north or the, on top of... that's the, You can see the slopes there with Stanley's. Just you said about the air, the airstrip not being used. Is it just kind of too early in, in, the, in the war for that kind of combined arms approach that comes in maybe a year and a half later? There's much more of that kind of well talking about airstrips and you know even commandos going in and taking things is it just too early yeah the japanese for some reason don't really use kokoda they could have used it but um they focus all their energies on the airstrip at buna right um originally they wanted to take the airstrip at kokoda they, they take it but by then all their resources are going into constructing the buna there was a strip of buna before the war it's a small strip but mm. the japanese um all their efforts go into buna and mind you um there's only about 50 kilometers between the two so the japanese basically use buna um okay. and by now the, the airstrip is pointless will soon be useless to australians because we're in japanese hands yeah okay no problem so now we, we go to um the first battle of kokoda and we can see the japanese have advanced all the way pretty much to um just just um east of kokoda morning 20th july and now kokoda now kokoda is lieutenant colonel owen lieutenant garland and 10 platoon and the second half of 16 platoon, or you know, about 50 men, they're all wondering what's happened to Templeton's men. No one knows what's happened to them. Having taken away the 300 or so Japanese are slowly but surely making their way to Kokoda. Now they're being extremely cautious because they've been ambushed a number of times. So the sudden advance has now come to a bit of a crawl. So they're slowly making their way carefully to Kokoda. Meanwhile, to Nick, the survivors of Temple, Templeton's force, around 70 men, assessing the situation. Um, at Kokoda, Owen informs Moresby. If he doesn't hear from Templeton's men by 11 a.m., he's going to have to withdraw because he's only got 50 men and there's around about 350 Japanese heading his way. Um, by 11 a.m., the stores Kokoda had been destroyed and the obstacles placed and obstacles placed on the runway. Owen and his men made their way to Nikki. And on arriving there, he finds the rest of his force, 70 men. So now um, Owen has is at Nikki, which is about 400 metres high above Kokoda, about four kilometres south. And he's got about 120 men at his disposal. Later that day, Captain Doc Vernon arrived at Daniki, having walked back from, from walked the track from Moresby. He'd been halfway across the track, um, inspecting the track because he's he's wanting to identify field hospital, field posts, um, field uh, regimental aid posts um, in case there's a there's fighting on the track. Um, and then he, he gets to Fogey, which is um, not he's about 30 kilometres from Dakota. And a runner comes up and says, oh, the Japanese are invaded. So words getting across the Kokoda track, the Japanese are invaded. So um, being a doctor, uh, Vernon, 61-year-old, 60 a World War One veteran, rushes to Kokoda because he knows his, uh, and he ends up at Daniki. Um, I only informed Moresby that, it, um, oh, sorry, uh, later that day, Doc Vernon, he arrives. Um, meanwhile, Graham, Swan and McKenna, these are the two guys that were ambushed and they're, they're lost. Um had joined up with Bitme. This is the guy that had been captured by the Japanese and managed to escape. So the three of them join up, um, and they're united by friendly Papuans. But also they're, they're joined by two American airmen 
Captain Peter Bender and Sergeant Arnold Thompson had been a B-25 shot down the previous day. Uh, and um, Captain Bender had been wounded in the ankle with a bullet, with a bullet to the ankle, but they parachuted out. The other airmen, which included Australian airmen, uh, the plane crashed and, and they, they were killed. Um, they were originally taken by friendly villagers to Tsingawa Missionary Station at Zavita. The missionaries are there. They fix up as best they can, Bender, and they pass him on because they hear where Graham Slaw is. They say, get him to Graham Slaw and the other guys. He might get them across the mountains. Um, and that day, Father Vivian uh, Rettledge, who's the head um, minister at Tsingawa Mission, um, he's one. He's still at, at, at um, Tsingawa Mission, just south, trying to wonder what's happening. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so on hearing that the Japanese had made their way to Kokoda, Owen radioed Moresby, standing he was moving out. So he, um, Owen finds out the Japanese, to his surprise, aren't at Kokoda. He tells, he radios Moresby saying, okay, Kokoda still hasn't been occupied. I'm going to take the bulk of my force back to Kokoda and try and defend it. Um, Doc Vernon moves out with Owen, but Owen says, no, you stay at Daniki. We'll bring the wounded to you. Um, there's no point in you coming to Kokoda. Uh, Vernon, Doc Vernon, 60-year-old guy, he's, he's half deaf. He, he, he suffered deafness from artillery fire in World War I, um, but now he uses selective deafness to not hear Owen. And while Owen and the men take off, um, Vernon stays behind Daniki, but as soon as Owen takes off, Vernon then goes to Daniki to look after the wounded. Selective hearing, he goes to Kokoda mm. anyway. Owen, by 11 o'clock, has 100 men, um, 80 men from the uh, from the 49th Battalion and about 20 men from the Papua New Battalion, they're at Kokoda digging in. A few hours later, Captain, uh, so um, we've got uh, Owen's now radio Port Moresby saying, quick, get the get D Company in. The airstrip will be free. It will be open so you can fly in um, reinforcements. Um, so they do. That day, um, while they're digging in at Kokoda, and, um, the men had cleared Kokoda airstrip, which had had obstacles put on it the previous day. And... Um, the C-47s are starting to, they can see them coming over the mountains. And of course, the, the guys are really relieved there's about to be at least another company arriving. Um, the planes, they see the planes fly over. They do a U-turn and the planes fly back to Moresby. On board the planes um, is um, the, lead, the commander of, of D Company who hears the over the radio because he's with the pilots. They're saying, evacuate, evacuate, don't land, don't land. The Japanese are there. Um, so the American pilots turn around, beat me, say, no, land, land, we have to land. But the American pilots are told to not to land because the Japanese apparently at the end of the run runway. So um, no further troops will land at Kokoda. Um, and so Owen sees his reinforcements fly back over the mountains. These guys land and they're going to spend another eight days. It took them 20 minutes to fly over. They're going to land and then they're going to have to walk eight days to get to, to wow. Daniki. Um now cautious, cautiously approaching Kokoda is Captain Ogawa and Number One Company, closely followed by Takahishi and Number Two Company, um, with platoon of the Fifth Special Naval Landing Party and a uh, combat platoon of the Fifty Fifth Combat Engineers. Uh, they're now approaching Kokoda, and uh, it's now that um, Australians start to see the advance in Japanese. Now on the Kokoda Plateau, at, on Kokoda Station, covering the northeast and eastern part. If we can change the move the slide, please. Um, covering the north, east, and eastern part of the plateau is Lieutenant Garland with Temple Tune. In the centre is Lieutenant Cyril with the Papuan Infantry Battalion. Covering the northwest and western part is Lieutenant Seacamp with 11 platoon. And the southwest and rear, covered by Lieutenant Mortimer, is 12, Mortimer is 12 platoon. Placed below the plateau, un, unenviously placed below the plateau is uh, Corporal Ridge Markham um, and his section of Garland's Temple Platoon. You'll see that. Um, there's a there's no you might be able to see B Company headquarters, and you'll see a little X and Smarkham's um section. Right. They're located just where the Japanese are going to storm through, the last place any man would want to be. They're a screening force and they're basically going to be sacrificed as a warning as a screen. Um place just below uh, yeah, um Doc Vernon, he establishes, you'll see where Doc Vernon establishes, if you can see the map, he's um RAP. Um meanwhile, Graham's former McKenna. Uh, Bitmead and US uh, Airmen, Bender and Thompson, they're at Ntunga Village um, and they've been told that Kokoda has fallen. So they've now got no choice, but they've got to make it over the mountains east of Kokoda. Mind you that um, Bender's wounded, um, he can't he can't go. So Grand Store is going to end up going alone over the mountains to bring back a rescue team, which he does. Next slide, please. There you go. 
Um, oh, sorry, sorry, I can go back to the next slide. Sorry. Yep. Um, so Lieutenant Garland recalled the appearance of the Japanese in the afternoon. At about four o'clock, we saw the Japanese around the tree line, about half a mile away. At that time, I did not mention to Colonel Owen. I did mention to Colonel Owen that he should not that he should take cover, but he ignored my advice and continued to walk around the periphery, inspecting his sections. My platoon occupied a position with Corporal Markham and his section below the ridge, and the other two sections along the top of the plateau. We expected to be attacked at night, um, but they didn't attack. So we expected an attack in the morning, but they attacked just after midnight. Meanwhile, Captain Sergeant Major Joe Dawson, 21-year-old Sergeant Major, had seen a Japanese moving up the Kokoda weavy part of the track, and he recalled, they started moving around the end of the perimeter, firing odd bursts in different directions and throwing in a few rounds of mortar fire. They're trying to draw fire from the Australians, trying to locate their positions. At one stage, as I was moving around our position on the left, at the rim of the plateau, I, I caught sight of the Japanese soldier looking around the airstrip. I took a shot. I don't know if I hit him or not, but he jumped and ducked for cover pretty smartly. Um, meanwhile, Japanese Sergeant Imanashi with Number 2 Company, he's approaching Kokoda with Number 2 Company, and he recalled, we were ordered to occupy the airfield of Kokoda. No one knew there was a hill. We knew nothing of the terrain, but we're very good at executing night attacks. We'd experienced that in China. Next slide, please. Now we're getting to the Japanese attack um, just mm -hmm. after midnight. Corporal Markham's position was the first to be targeted by the Japanese before midnight. The main assault fell on Seacom's 11 platoon just after midnight by Agawa and Number 1 Company. In the fighting here, the battalion commander was mortally wounded with a shot to the head while he was throwing a grenade. Um, he led from the front. In the attack, Japanese um, Captain Agawa was also killed. Doc Vernon and Wilkinson moved out from their RP under heavy fire to bring in the wounded um, Major Bill Watson, but there's nothing they could do for him. They brought him out, but there's nothing they can do for him. Now Garland and Templin were under attack. This is midnight and it's pouring rain. The Japanese were targeting the entire plateau with medium machine gun fire, mortar fire, and mountain guns. The Japanese could mass at any one point um, a mass of troops um, along the Finley Stretch Australian line and Papuan line. By 3.30 p.m., the Japanese had broken through the northern perimeter. Fighting was now hand to hand. At one point, the company 2IC Captain Stevenson was yelling encouragement to his men close by. But he only realised when the um, grenades were exploding from the grenade flashes that the men he was yelling at were actually Japanese. Hmm. Doc Vernon managed to get the wounded back to Daniki, but he refused to go. He was going to stay and make sure the last of the wounded, the last of the men got out. So when he got the wounded out, he stayed there. Soon after, Watson ordered the plateau to be evacuated because Watson was now in command with the death of, of Owen. He ordered Garland and Templeton to hold back the Japanese as best they could while the rest of the, the men withdrew. Garland recalled, Major Watson ordered my platoon to withdraw and form, a and form a line across the plateau in readiness for 11 and 12 platoons to withdraw through us. By now, I only had two sections with us um, to form this line as Corporal Markham and his section below the ridge could not be contacted. A runner sent to tell Corporal Markham what we were to do, but they failed to locate him. And when we shouted out to him, we got no response. Our withdrawal from Kokoda Plateau continued, platoon by platoon, until we reached Daniki. That was my platoon's first action against the Japanese, and one I will never forget. As the last of Watson's men withdrew, two Bren gunners, Privates William Parr and Horace from Rusty Hollow, remained behind and covered the last men as they fell back. They were just south of the station in the plateau within the rubber plantation. At one point, they fired on a Japanese platoon that was advancing towards the retreating Australians, but the Japanese fell back. Um, a number of Japanese were killed by the Bren guns. Close by was Doc Vernon, who had refused to leave until he was sure all the, all the wounded and all of the men had gotten out. But he was occasionally hiding behind a tree, taking a drag from a cigarette, a soft rolled cigarette. Soon Vernon saw Watson and a few others passing through the plantation. Watson told Vernon and the Bren gunners, Power and Hollow, to clear out as they were the last ones there. By daylight, 29th July, Watson and his men were digging in 400 metres above the plat Kokoda Plateau at Taniki. Um, below them, they could see in daylight the hive of Japanese activity to raise Kokoda Plateau. So you've got the first, second company, and now Lieutenant knows uh, Minu Kakashi and his 100 men of number three Plateau. They're also arriving Kokoda, back Kokoda. Right. Next slide, please. Just got a couple of questions for you before we move on. I'll move on. But yep. um, people are asking about medals, basically. Matthew Kelly over in your part of the world is saying, why didn't Vernon get a VC? And someone's saying, because maybe technically because he was civilian, but generally speaking, in terms of this defence, uh, as a historian, uh, enough recognition with medals, too much recognition, not enough recognition, the uh, right people didn't not, get recognised? Um, 
Vernon and Kiensel, who were both with Ango and were responsible for like what at, what Vernon just did, Doc Vernon, and and Kiensel, who did outstanding work and was often in the line of fire. Um, of course, they weren't military. They got the order of the British Empire. That was the highest right. thing they got. And that I'm not. That's not being derogatory, but um, yeah, that's yeah. They weren't military. That's that, that's what they got. Um, and uh, a lot of the guys um, were not got no 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 awards whatsoever. Mm. Well, that's the, the unfairness of medals. It's a, it's a rabbit hole that we could spend a lot of time down. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's just interesting to what your take is. But, yeah, anyway, back to the back. We're loving it, by the way. People, some people are oh, up thanks. early for it. Some people are staying up late for it, depending on where they are in the world. But, yeah, brilliant stuff. So, uh, back to you. Oh, thanks. Uh, so, now, next, um, on 29th of July, we've got this heroic, heroic effort. Now, I normally don't use heroism lightly, I've never used the word. Uh, but um, Major Floyd Buck Rogers and his airmen um, go down as heroes. Um, on 29th July 1942, they were part of the US 8th Attack Squadron. They go over Guna, Gona, sorry, to bomb a Japanese convoy that arrived. So um, they fly over the mountains in these, they're basically Doug, Douglas Dauntless. They're, they're, Banshee, they're, they're, they're an army version of the Douglas Dauntless. It's a Banshee um, dive bomber, slow Columbus and Almost as bad as the Australian we always, but probably slightly better, but they're, they're hopeless against Japanese heroes. Um, they go over the mountains to attack this convoy, and um, because of the dense cloud cover, they lose their fighter support. Uh, Floyd um, decides to go ahead anyway um, to attack. He knows he's got no fighter support. He knows there are zeros flying around because there's, there's an airfield further west at, um, at Ley, um, and there are Japanese zero fighters in the area and here's a painting of the action on that day um you can see these um banshee it's a basic dauntless army dauntless dive bombers um being shot to pieces so they, they go and attack the um going to convoy on approaching their targets the slow commerce and dive bombers would jump these are five dive bombers and jump by nine agile zero fighters even so the american pilots bravely attempted to dive bomb the japanese convoy but only rogers scored a direct hit the courageous pilots and their rear gunners were last seen as their planes, uh, as, as, as Floyd, the only, um, Floyd was last, sorry, was last seen as his plane plunges into the sea in flames. Only one dive bomb up returned to Port Moresby, and that was by, uh, piloted by Lieutenant John Hill, who made it back to Moresby, but his rear gunner, Sergeant Ralph Sam, suffered a mortal wound. Um, those aircraft flown by Captain Virgil Schwab, Lieutenants Big Joe Parker, Robert Castles, and Claude Dean, along with their rear gunners, failed to return or believed that they had crashed into the sea. However, Parker had barely landed his aircraft on a beach near Ambassy, which was about 50 kilometres north. He and his um, gunner, Corporal Franklin Hoop, survived. Dean also managed to make a successful landing nearby with his rear gunner, Sergeant Laurie LaBeouf. Lieutenant Castles managed to bail out of his stricken um, dive bomber, um, but the fate of his gunner remains unknown. He obviously was killed. Um, Within days, all five would join Captain Smith, who is the guy named Bosey with the Captain of the Battalion. Um, uh, they will join up with that battalion and all are now stranded behind the Japanese lines and will come back to these airmen very soon. Next slide, please. Now, this is the um, second battle for Kokoda. Here's an aerial shot, and you can see here the um, running diagonally across the screen, you can see the Owen Stanleys. Um, Kokoda is down the bottom, and you can see um, Daniki, at the bottom bottom right, and then you've got um, Mesa Ridge, and you can just see Utarava is just cut off. But this is the start of the climb up into the Iron Stanley Mountains. So um, the Australians and, and Poppins now Taniki and the Japanese are now Kokoda. Um, that morning, Captain Dean and his men of sea company arrived at Taniki. So um, because of the fighting ability of Captain Tambor and B Company, they were able to store the Japanese and, and the Papuan troops were able to store the Japanese to a point that the Australian, rest of the Australian fleet in Opitani starting to arrive at Daniki, which is up in the, the northern foothills of the um, Owen Stanleys. Major Alan Cameron, uh, with the, uh, Major Alan Cameron with the death of Lieutenant Colonel Owen, was placed in temporary command of the 39th Battalion. He's in Port Moresby. He's going to do a tremendous track. He's going to track from Port Moresby to take over command of the 39th Battalion in three days. And I don't know of anyone who travelled, who walked the Kokoda track in three days. But it's tremendous effort. He he did it. He got there within three days. Mm. The fight, um, next day, 31 July, there was still no sign of any Japanese advance from Kokoda. Um, and 
meanwhile, the battalion's still digging in at, at um, Daniki, waiting for the arrival of the rest. Um, sorry, we can go back to the other slide. Right. Yeah. Um, um, 2nd of August, Bert Kenzel located two dry lake beds at Myola. Um, and you can just see what was Myola. Is Myola on the top right? It's cut off. It's got Myola. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are two dry lake beds, which are famous. Um, this is where basically Australian supplies are going to be dropped by what we call biscuit bombers. Um, Kenzel found these and, and that because they were dropping later on, a few weeks later, they were dropping supplies and it was going to the mountains and they're losing basically 80% of the supplies. Myola was a dry lake bed, flat plateau. And the bombers were able to drop supplies and troops were able to collect them and um, resupply. So that was an important event. Um, breaking all re records, as I said, Alan, um, Alan Cameron arrives at Nikki on the 4th of August. Cameron blamed, however, to, to his discredit, uh, instead of arriving and, comm and commending B Company for doing such an outstanding job in delaying the Japanese, he roars into them, into the officers and man, he calls them basically cowards. Uh, he tells them they're not fit to be a rifle but, uh, rifle company. He wants to disband them. The men are shell shocked, and other officers who were there saying who have arrived basically convinced Cameron not to disband B Company. Um, Cameron is discussing with B Company, undeservedly so, but um, to show he doesn't have any trust, he sends them to Usarava, while the rest of the company moves forward. He, he wants nothing to do with B Company, which is a travesty. These guys do outstanding work along with the Papuan troops. Um, but Meanwhile, Cameron sends out patrols towards Kokoda to find out what the Japanese are doing, um, to see if they're advancing. There's no sign the Japanese are going to advance. They're waiting for reinforcements. Slowly but surely, more Japanese are arriving at Kokoda Station, which was their original primary objective, and they're building up supplies and, and reinforcements. Um, but while they're doing supplies, um, while they're doing patrols, they find three main tracks from Daniki that lead to Kokoda. One to the west, which is widely known, one to the east, which is the main Kokoda track, in the middle, in the centre, there's another unknown, largely unknown track that's discovered. And um, Cameron decides this is going to be a, a track that will allow him to, to take Dakota. Because they, um, Australians and Papuans do a reconnaissance on this track for a couple of days and no Japanese are on the track. There's no sign of Japanese even know this track, track is there. So Cameron decides once his companies get to Daniki, he's going to launch an attack to retake Dakota. Next slide, please. Okay. Oh, sorry, uh, next slide. That's okay, seven, so okay. As you can see here, you've got the three tracks um, left and right, and that dotted line is in order to reach the, that track, they have to go through the jungle, and just near the creek, they'll hit the track where it's got A Company, and they will go all the way to Kokoda. Meanwhile, C and D Companies will try and attack Kokoda from, from the flanks. So early morning, um, found Cameron finalising his plan and issued his orders um, to um, the commanders of A, C, and D companies. In the centre, Captain Symington and A Company would approach Kokoda Plateau using the central track. Um, to the west, Captain Dean and C Company would clear the Niki Kokoda track, that's the main track of Japanese. To the east, Captain Bidstrip and D Company would advance using the track to Perivi to set up an ambush position east and west of the Kokoda track. Um, so where we've got Perivi on, you can see that on, with the dot and the arrow. Yep. Either side, you can see the main track that leads to Kokoda. Um, D Company is going to set up an ambush just west and east of that junction because we they know there's Japanese combat engineers along that track to the east and the west of that T intersection. So they're going to set up two ambushes to stop any Japanese trying to reinforce Kokoda from, um, from the east. Um, unknown to Cameron, however, Japanese Lieutenant Colonel Sukamoto leading the 1st Battalion, the 144th Regiment, on the 8th of August, he's planning to attack Daniki. So there's going to be a collision along the main Kokoda track, which is between Kokoda and where C Company is. The Japanese are going to come down that main Kokoda track where C Company is going to be. So they're going to collide. Um, meanwhile, Reverend Holland um, and the Sangawa Mission Station is concerned about um, these are the missionaries. They're concerned of their presence at Isa Vida, that they're um, going to endanger the local locals there and he decides that they have to leave because the Japanese might do um might take it out on the local population if they're found to be hiding the missionary. So they decide that they're gonna go to Uru Bay on the seventh of August. They plan to meet up with um the early sea captain Lewis Austin, um, who's at Sibarada. Um and they all decide because they they're communicating with each other, they're gonna go to Oro Bay and wait for a, um, a ship to arrive to to rescue them. Um meanwhile with Austin at this point at Sibarada is um 
plantation manager Anthony Gore, his wife and their seven-year-old son. So they were going to get together oh. and start moving to the coast, hoping that there's going to be a rescue ship. Um, meanwhile, the US Marines, and here we go back to the South Sea Zone on the 7th of August, most people will know, US Marines land at Guadalcanal. So on the 7th of August, we've got the US Marines attacking what was to be the eastern stretch of the Japanese South Seas resource zone, I saw, saw the Japanese resource zone. And now in New Guinea, we've got the Australian Papuan troops fighting the Japanese to the west of the resource zone. So now we've got a campaign going on against the Japanese at New Guinea and the Japanese in the Solomons because they're trying to do this link to stop, a, a, do a defense, they call it a resource zone, but it's basically a buffer zone. Um, to stop the Australians and the Americans from being able to launch invasions and bombers and air fleets against their southern resource zone. So now um, New Guinea and New, Gu New Guinea and Guadalcanal, we've got this battle raging um, at the buffer zone. And this is what we talked about before, the significance of Guadalcanal and New Guinea being seen as one campaign. Next slide, please. So the 8th of August, um, this is the day of the attack against Kokoda, and this is the Japanese attack against Taniki. On the right, Bishop D Company near the village of Parivi and where fighting breaks out. Um, and that's on, yeah, as you can see on the left, on the right, sorry. Reaching the main Kokoda track, Lieutenant McLean, 16 platoon, take up an ambush position east of the T intersection, while Sergeant Marsh and 7 platoon take up position west of the junction. You can see the two dots there on the main track. They're ambush positions waiting for Japanese combat troops to try and advance towards Kokoda or come towards Parivi. Um, within minutes of having heard the fighting at Parivi, however, the Japanese 55th combat elements, which are on either side of the track, they rush to reinforce their men in the village. Um, Bistrip, um, then they, the Japanese coming down from Kokoda towards the village of Parivi from the west, and then you've got the Japanese on the east, they're all colliding to come down Parivi to reinforce their troops at Parivi. They're, they fall into the two ambushes, you can see the two dots. They fall into the Australian ambush. Um, now, McLean on, the, on to the east, he manages to um, inflict casualties against the Japanese and he manages to fall back. However, to the west, Marsh and 17 platoon, they're trapped, they're surrounded. Um, now, the rest of deep a deep company try to reach marsh's 7 april team they can't break through and um they're forced to fall back through perivi and um what happens there is bishop could not break through the seven platoon and his remaining two platoons had to fight their way to perivi because they've been reinforced uh, to get back to kabara um medic jack wilkinson recall carried wanted back to perivi estimated jack cabbies 20 killed 25 wounded on aravi uvai kokoda track 20 Japs in village, 10 minutes after we left. One man, that's, that's after they break through originally, 20 minutes, um, they break through, but then as they're fighting on the track, reinforcements and around number 20 Japanese arrived in the village behind them. One man killed on the road, bullet struck him straight down the neck and traveled down his body. Instant death and rigidity. Still knelt up and held his rifle in ready position. An awesome sight. I thought he was still alive. Hell of a mess at Perivi village during scrimmage. Believed I pinned Jap to ground with bayonet and screamed with laughter. Remember putting field dressing on one of our chaps and fired at the roof of the houses of some of the Japanese. One of my police went back to nature and used his rifle as a club. Hmm. Meanwhile, on the left, Cameron leading the main thrust with C Company collided with Lieutenant Colonel Sukamoto in the 144th Regiment near Ferrari Creek on the Kokoda Track. In a fighting here, Captain Arthur Dean, who was commanding C Company, he's killed. Um, barely, he's barely, uh, so, so Dean and um, Cameron's men are outnumbered at least three to one, and they're forced to fall back towards Taniki. In the centre, Captain Noel Symington and A Company, um, they left Taniki, they go through the, through the jungle. Um, uh, Lance Corporal Snoper, who got them out of Taniki, is the same guy that, that leads these men through the jungle to get to the track. Um, and they end up on the track, they make their way along the track, and they get to Kokoda. And there's very few, there's only one or two Japanese there who, who bolt. And so um, A Company start entrenching around Kokoda. They've captured the plateau. Meanwhile, they've got no idea that C Company, D, uh, C Company and D Company are basically being forced back. And 17 Platoon is trapped um, on, the, on the Kokoda or EV track. Next slide, please. Just got a quick question for Alex Parkey. Does David consider Cameron's counterattack to be irresponsible as they were all that stood between them and Port Moresby? 
That's a good question, and that's one I I often thought about. <laughs> uh, I conclude that um, it was probably the only thing. He, he was ordered to take Kokoda, so he basically had no choice. Um, and I think there are two reasons why the Japanese really slowed down their advance after this. One was because Templeton gave um, false information about the numbers. Right. So the Japanese really started to think, okay, 1,000 Australians at Kokoda, well, no, less than 100, um, 80,000 troops, Moresby. The second thing was, um, oh, so there's three things. And then there's the fighting ability of B platoon that kept falling back and fighting and not setting ambushes. Um, and then you've got um, this attack by Cameron, which throws the Japanese off because um, the Australians and the Papuans now launching an offensive against the Japanese. So I think this ultimately was the right thing to do because uh, it really delayed the Japanese. Advance. After this, um, the Japanese really slow down and um, they're sitting at Kokoda. Um, in a few days, they'll attack the Niki, but after Niki, they, they slowed, they're stuck for about two weeks thinking about what to do because they're really concerned. So I think, um, yep, I think Templeton's uh, misinformation slowed the Japanese down. I think the fighting abilities of B Company and the Papua Nifty Battalion um, slowing down on Japanese, put the Japanese into some misgivings about what was going on, about the fighting abilities of the Australians and the Papua And then Cameron's a, a, attack, which many would say was probably not the wisest move, really threw the Japanese off. And they made them think twice because now they're being attacked. So ultimately, I think it was the right thing to do. Even though uh, It's also uh, fair to say that you, you've had a long time now to analyse this with full information or at least better information than most of these individual oh, yeah. the commanders had very little information about what was happening 50 yards to their left or right, let alone the greater picture about Japanese strength and reserves and things like that. So it's the, the age old thing about being able to judge a situation better with the benefit of years study than, than these, these guys who were doing it rather on the fly at the time. Oh yeah. And um, I, I, I recall that um, bit strip, and um, something that they weren't overly excited by the, the planning. Mm. Um, they didn't think there was enough reconnaissance had been done, and um, uh, they were ultimately shown to be right. Tactically, it wasn't a wise move, but um, I wouldn't call it strategy, but if you get at a micro level of strategy, it's probably tactically it wasn't wise, but it did throw the Japanese off. And when they eventually take Daniki, okay. that stopped them in their tracks for a couple of weeks, which was, which, which was critical. Um, right. So uh, we're now to the 9th of August. Um, this is the day after the eight companies um, taken over the plateau. And there, as you'll see there, they're digging in. Um, mine is the day before um, the Japanese realised that uh, the Australians, some Australians are taking Kokoda. So the Japanese do a U-turn and go back to attack Kokoda the next morning. My new um, a party of Japanese are also sent up to Daniki to keep Cameron pinned down. They don't want Cameron and other troops coming down to reinforce the Australians at Kokoda. But the main bulk of the force of the Japanese do a U turn and they head back to Kokoda because they hear that the Australians are taking Kokoda. But A Company, well, they don't know it's A Company and they don't even know how many Australians are there, but they know the Australians are there. So I went to the 144th Regiment, attacked Daniki that morning to keep Cameron pinned down. Well, the bulk of the Japanese are now heading uh, basically just south of Kokoda Plateau. Um, mind you, hearing the fighting at Daniki, Captain Bistrop D Company, they're still to the east. They, they can hear the Japanese attacking Daniki. So Bistrop, um, now, mind you, that night, a lot of Marsh's men, 7th Platoon, they were able to escape. Marsh tells the men to clear out. So a lot of 7th Platoon are able to escape from the Japanese. They were surrounded to the west of the Kota Track. They were able at night during the thunderstorm to get out. They reached um, Bistrop in the morning. And, and just as these men are coming in, seven people are coming in, some of the men are lost, they're killed, never seen again. The bulk come around, they arrive. The bishop can hear the fighting going to his west um, at Taniki. So he's got to rush back to support Cameron because he's got no idea eight companies reach Kokoda. He thinks everyone's still has been forced back to Taniki. So he rushes back to support Cameron. Mayor of Kokoda, Symington had placed, as you'll see on the map, Lieutenant Neil and Nine Platoon to cover the southern approach. Lieutenant Trotter and 7th Platoon covered the western and northwestern corner, and Sergeant Guest and 8th Platoon covered the northeast and eastern edge of the plateau. Now, of course, the Japanese coming from the south are going to attack likely the southern element, which is 9th Platoon. At around 11, 11 a.m., advanced elements of number one company, 1st uh, Battalion, 144th Regiment, about 100 men are seen um, moving quietly, uh, cautiously through the rubber plantation. Um, stoffily towards 9 Platoon's position. Within minutes, the first attack was launched against the southern perimeter 
Within an hour, three assaults are made against them and each is repulsed. The Japanese now dug in less than 50 metres from nine platoon, and it was not long before um, Japanese snipers um, climbed up into the, into the trees. This is a plantation. They've climbed up into the trees. Not only the Japanese snipers taking out the men in their foxholes, nine platoon, but they're also taking out um, men around the perimeter, men of um, nine, um, seven and eight platoon, all, all getting targeted by the Japanese in the trees. Attacks from our launch against seven platoon, uh, covering um, the airstrip. And not long after, another force attacks um, the northern perimeter as well. So the Japanese are launching the main thrust is to the south, but they're doing feints also around the western and um, northern perimeter. Um, here is Le Japanese Lieutenant Haro Kugaro, and he's in of number three platoon, along with the rest of number platoon. Um, they're attacking Kokoda. He recalled, reached a rubber plantation at um, 1,000, well, 1,000 hours, 10, 10 a.m. After reconnaissance, the company carried out a deployed attack with an additional machine gun. Detected not progress as desired because the enemy's intense fire, power, and ongoing rain. We were unable to communicate with the company commander of number one platoon. Decided to carry out a charge independently at dusk. Reported this to the company commander and gradually closed in on the enemy. Meanwhile, um, Lance Corporal Lockheed, covering the left flank of nine platoon, which is, you see, Lockheed um, at the southern east part of the, the plateau, he records, during the rest of the daylight, the Japs put in four or five attacks, but all were repulsed. They were obviously moving across our front to draw fire. My section was pinned down by fire from a light machine gun, and two snipers who succeeded in wounding both my Bren gun crews, Vic Smythe and Ron Dryden. The rest of the section were were behind rubber trees to our rear. During the night, there was a lot of movement. The Japs had pinpointed our positions and came in amongst us. It was pitch dark and they must have been guessing, but they guessed, pre but they guessed pretty well. My section must have done a lot of damage and annoyed them. We had no sleep that night. Next slide, please. Uh, 10 August, um, this is the second day of A Company on the plateau. By 10 a.m. around here on Japanese charge seven platoons position, that's on the west near the airfield, um, almost penetrating. We want to hear there's some hand-to-hand -hand fighting, but the Japanese are thrown back. Fighting east um, during after that and was basically down to Japanese sniping of um, pinpointed Australian positions. Mind you, they're also um, submerging or they're the dominating the plateau with um, light and medium machine gun fire mortars and at least one mountain gun. And the Australians don't have any of these. The, the best they've got is Bren guns. Um, most of them have got um, 303 rifles. Um, the plateau, uh, yeah, by 5 p.m., the Australians on the plateau observed intense Japanese activity. Um, men are starting to realise the Japanese are massing up for a big attack and I think this is probably going to be their downfall because they're looking south for reinforcements and supplies. Um, Simicon realises they're low on ammunition and he decides if we don't get any sign of reinforcements or ammunition by 6pm, um, we're going to have to evacuate. Um, as per usual, there's a major thunderstorm breaks out after dusk, which is going to be a blessing to the Australians. Um, but 30 minutes after the Australians had seen this massing, this, these Japanese massing, massing towards around the, the um, airstrip, 300 Japanese are launched against the plateau and somehow um, they were pulsed. This basically uses up the last of the ammunition. And um, you've got guys running around trying to, to scrounge wounded um, ammunition from the wounded um, th because they've got bugger ammunition now. Captain Simonton gives the orders to evacuate the plateau um, if that, by, by 7 p.m., as I said, if they don't get any reinforcements or supply. Um, and at dusk, there's a tropical thunderstorm breaks out. 7 p.m., the men of 7 platoon lead the withdrawal. They're, 7 platoon are told to lead the withdrawal. Uh, to be covered by eight platoon, poor old nine platoon, and Mackay was with the section on you know, on the plateau. You can see Mackay section um, just to the um, west of nine platoon in the corner there. They're ordered to hold back the Japanese because the main Japanese thrust is still to is now to the west, uh, to the south. They're to hold the position while the rest and the wounded get out, uh, move out during the thunderstorm across the airfield to the jungle to the west. Um, so um, seven platoon get out, eight platoon are charged with getting out the wounded. They manage to get out, and they only get out because there's a thunderstorm going on and uh, the Japanese can't see them through the rain, and they manage to get out off the plateau. Mind you, while, those, while the men of um, seven and eight platoon are evacuating, the Japanese are launching probing attacks against nine platoon, so they're pinned down and um, 
trying trying to stop the Japanese attack while the rest of the men get off. Um, but at this point, um, uh, great war veteran Jim Cow, he was very much a father figure to the uh, battalion, and he's a major unsung hero of the, the campaign as far as I'm concerned. Um, he arrives um, with two men. He refuses to leave. Um, they um, rock up behind nine platoon to help cover their two men, three men, guessing two men. Uh, Gary, sorry, and two men come up behind nine platoon. He's not going to leave them behind. Um, so as Neil and Mackay's men finally are able to disengage from the Japanese, they're, they're moving off the plateau. Um, so as Neil and Mackay's men finally withdraw, they were likely not surprised to see Kaori in the pouring rain, covering their withdrawal of his 303 Enfield rifle at the ready. Mackay recalled, we only moved a few more yards and we were challenged. It was old Jim Cowie, the coolest, bravest man I ever knew. There he was, kneeling in the rain with his rifle pointing at us. Jim's motto was, if you were a digger, we had to get you out. The rest of the company had gone, but he'd stayed to make sure we were, we, we got out alive. Me and I, Sergeant William, guest leading 8th platoon, he'd got out with the wounded. Um, so by the next day, uh, most of these men get off the plateau. They go west in, into the mountains. And um, within days, they rock up at, um, not all of them, but most of them rock up at Usarava and Janiki. And this is primarily because um, of the leadership of Sergeant's guest and Cowie, who would um, basically get the men through the jungle and get them back to Janiki. Next slide, please. That's basically the battle for the plateau. Mind you, the Japanese now hold Kokoda and reinforcements are arriving. So the last part is what happened to the Sangara and Gona missionaries? Um, we're at the point where the, the fighting is about to take place in the Kokoda Mountains. Uh, sorry, in the, in the Owen Stanley Range. Up until now, it's all been fighting on land. Now they're at Taniki, and we're about to hit the, the first stage of the Kokoda campaign in the mountains. So uh, while all this fighting is going on, so what's happening to the Gona and Gawa missionaries? So between – next slide, please. So between 10 and 13 August, the Gawa party by 10 August had reached uh, Siwa village where they were joined by Captain Austin and his small party. This group now consisted of 10 people, Austin, Holland, Sisters Benchley and Lashmar, lay preacher Duffield, evangelist Tapiadi, plantation manager Gores, his wife and his seven-year-old son, and 16-year-old Louise Artengo, who was of a Filipino New Guinea extraction. A few days later, they left for Oro Bay. Crossing a creek, after travelling a short distance, they realised that an important item he left behind. Lucy and Tapiadi went back to collect the package um, and then he was killed by a um, collaborator with Japanese. It's likely that this package was left behind. Um, Tapietti is the only strong man in the, in the group, so they wanted to isolate him. So it's, it's suspected that they left the package behind. And so one of the guys, one of the packages, oh, the package is gone. So, um, but he's, he goes back and it's believed that he was, um, it was he was sent back by the Papans on purposely so that he'd be isolated and killed because um, the, the rest of the people were pretty much fair game. Meanwhile, the rest of the party crossed the creek near Dabadua, which would become famous as a major airfield later in the campaign, where they were attacked by their guides, dragged out of the creek and taken to the village of Mbai, where the women were raped by the villagers. The next morning, 12 August, the headmen took their prisoners to Gawari Plantation near Buna. Here they were delivered to the Japanese. Outside the headquarters of Number 5 Special Naval Landing Party, they were interrogated. Next morning, the prisoners were taken by truck to the beach where they were forced to kneel and one by one they were executed. The beheading of Louise Artango, that's a 16-year-old girl, was bungled as she was forced to, on her knees in terror and suffered several sword strokes. An unknown Japanese soldier recorded the reaction of a witness. The man was said to be so sickened by the spectacle as she was very beautiful and she struggled until forcibly held that he could not stand it. He turned away. Anthony Gore's wife, and son were the last to be killed. The little boy buried his face in his mother's breast, obviously terrified, unlike the others who were shot in the head. Uh, unlike the others, they weren't beheaded, they were shot in the head, and all the bodies were dumped unceremoniously into the sea. Their executioner, oh, sorry, can we move on? Oh, sorry, no, 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 skip it there, sorry. And you'll see the um, the Japanese off, um, samurai, the, 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 the Japanese officer with the samurai sword. He's the chap who actually did the executing of the Sangara mission party. The executioner was Sub-Lieutenant Kumai Ushi, who would later also become infamous for the heading of the 23-year-old Australian flight Lieutenant William Newton, VC. There's an airman who got the Victoria Cross. It was later executed by this individual. A photograph of Kumai, which you see there, 
um, of beheading Australian Commando Sergeant Syphilet was found by American soldiers in April 1944 and remains one of the most poignant and best known images of the Pacific War. Next slide, please. Now we'll go on to the Gona Mission, the fate of the Gona Mission Party, um, 11-12 August 1942. Father Benson and Sister Heyman and Parkson were now forced to leave the safety of their hideout at Sire, with rumours that the Japanese troops were approaching. It was also told that a local saucer was out to um, to kill them in order to pacify the, any Japanese that might appear in the area. So that they'll, if they'd stayed there, they would have been safe, but they were forced to move out from fear of the Japanese. But not far away, Lieutenant Arthur Smith, this is um, the... Uh, Australian officer with the um, Papua Infantry Battalion who, who worked around Obusi knows that the Japanese have occupied Kokoda. He's trapped behind the Japanese line. He hears of the Gona missionaries and he contacts them to join him not far away So because uh, they're going to make an attempt to get back to the Australian lines. So um, Benson and, and Mavis and May, they um, join Smith. Um, by now, with Smith are the five American airmen who had uh, been part of um, Major Floyd's uh, Floyd Rogers' um, uh, squadron who's, that, that was shot down. Those five airmen um, who had bailed out or had landed, um, they were taken to to Smith, who was part of the PIB. And so now you've got um, Tangawa missionaries, you've got the American airmen, and um, you've got um, a couple of PIB men with Smith. Now also joining them, if you remember, there were two Australian Coast Watchers at the Gona Mission Station during the landing who went down the beach to confront the Japanese but um, were requested to leave. They're also now with um, Major Smith. So now you've got all these large numbers of people trying to escape the Japanese. Um, after a few days of exhausting slog through the lowland jungle and scrub, all of them reached the area of Popendera. Um, Popendera is, uh, you, you see, this is, a rough estimate of the line yeah. that they took, and they end up near near Popendetta. Um Here they cross, a, uh, they come across a local volunteer to help them. The local rose to his to his feet. You stop here, he whispered. Me go, Popendetta. Look, see Japan. He stopped. Another local man who had joined them warned Smith, uh, Kubata, do not let him go. He take us to Japan. It was too late. The man, and the other man had disappeared. The party now quickly realised this guy was a collaborator and they quickly retraced their steps back away from uh, Popendetta. Um, meanwhile, Japanese, uh, meanwhile, some of the men from the PIB um, were at the rear and they hear Japanese. They said, um, they yell out, oh, they run, come running to Smith and say, oh, the Japanese are coming behind us. Um, so American pilot Big Joe Barker, who was, who was part of the bombing squadron, with a Tommy gun, lay prone on the ground covering the Japanese approach, while kneeling behind on either side of him were the Australian Coast Watchers and other American airmen with rifles. May, Mavis and, and Benson took cover in a nearby scrub, while Smith with his revolver and remaining Australians covered the flanks of the track. Meanwhile, uh, soon after three public and troops move out and circle around the position, they returned 10 minutes later with welcome news that the Japanese had gone. They now succeeded in crossing the main track, Father Benson recalled. I remember seeing Smith, by, I remember shaking Smith by the hand and saying, that's our biggest hurdle crossed. I remember out of the corner of my eyes seeing the happy smiles of the sisters as they chatted gaily with Big Joe. Then came the strata of rifle fire. We spanned around and before I dived headlong into the bush, my mind registered the scene of exact detail. The 18 or 20 Japanese with rifles to their shoulders ranged along the edge of a clearing less than 50, files, less than 50 yards away firing at them flying at us. The party took off into the bush, but Father Benson became lost. He recalled laying alone in the bush, hearing the sound of Big Joe's Tommy gun rattling, a scatter of bullets of the Japanese, which soon um, faded into the distance. Father Benson would, would hand himself over to the Japanese after stumbling alone in the jungle, and he would become a POW. Out of all of the um, Sangara and, mission, and Gona missionaries, he alone would be the only survivor. So um, he survived... Um, He's the devastation of his family being drowned and he survived everyone um, being killed. So he had two major devastations in his life. Wow. He was later um, recovered by Australian POWs in um, New Britain. Next slide, please. And yeah, you can all be brief aside relief really, in there in the end. Um, this is um, having entered the Japanese, the re uh, having avoided the Japanese, the rest of the Gona party had reached Dabadua just before darkness on 13 in August. Most of the villagers welcomed them, but one bolted in the jungle to warn the Japanese. 
Early next morning, they moved out from Dabadua and had only gone a short distance when behind them they, they heard a commotion and they turned around. Behind them were turning Japanese and quickly opened fire. Smith, Mavis and May quickly disappeared in the bush while remaining Australians and Americans in front of the enemy, conducting one side of the fair, allowing the missionary women to escape. They had no chance and a few wounded survivors were quickly bayoneted by the Japanese, but three American airmen managed to escape into the bush. Next day, the three American airmen stumbled into Jagarita village where they traded for food before setting out again, but they did not get far. They stumbled into an ambush by locals who killed two of the Japanese, clubbing them to death. Uh, the third didn't um, manage to escape in though he speared, but he didn't get far and within hours he also was killed. Meanwhile, Mavis and May, after escaping the jungle, lost contact with Lieutenant Smith. Two days later, they were back at Dabadua, where a friendly villager um, hid them. Meanwhile, Smith spent several days searching for May and Mavis. The starving officer was eventually found eating sweet potato from a local garden when locals locked up one with a rifle. He was captured. He was taken to the Japanese. Within hours, he was kept taken to the Japanese. Smith arrived at Buna and was brutally interrogated. Witnesses later said that a Japanese interpreter, Sato Toshio, asked him several questions about the defence of Port Moresby, but Smith refused to give any answer. Seattle replied, We will give you another chance. If you will tell us, we will treat you as a prisoner of war. If you don't, it looks like you will not see your family again. If you will think about your children and your wife at home, it is far better for you to talk to us. Smith again refused and he was handed over to the medical officer of the 14th Pioneer Regiment, Captain Kato Jinjiro, and beheaded, beheaded by a medical officer. Hmm. Meanwhile, sisters Hayman and Parkland had days before left Dabadua, heading for the next friendly village um, with two guides. Um, the immediate destination of the village was Jagarada, the same village that betrayed the American airmen. Before reaching Jagaretta, they spent the night in the hut of a friendly villager, Michael Akut. The next morning, the original friendly guides, and they were friendly guides, were replaced with two others who weren't so friendly, who took them to the village headman, Jagaretta. He told the sisters he would take them on to the next friendly village. However, he led them to Papandetta on awaiting Japanese. On hearing of their betrayal, Michael Akut raced to Papandetta to see if he could help them. On getting there, he was informed that two women were being, two women were being held by the Japanese in a nearby flour, uh, coffee plantation. A kid approached the mill, coffee mill, which was near a creek, and found a large group of Japanese taunting the two women, giving them a biscuit each, and snatching it away from them before they could eat it. All were laughing. He watched as the women went to the creek to get a drink under the heavy guard. It was now that May and Marvis recognised their friend and waved him away, fearful that he might be attacked by the Japanese. He refused to leave and stayed as close as he dare, seeking an opportunity to help them escape from the Japanese. But soldiers were all around, and some entering and leaving the hut throughout the night. At around 3pm the next day, four soldiers approached the mill and took the two women to the nearby coffee plantation. Uh, um, a cute follow close to behind, hiding behind um, trees as he went. May, Hayman and Marvis Parkinson must have known their fate, as two of the four soldiers were carrying shovels. The other two were carrying, were holding bayonets in their hands. 300 metres in the plantation, a Japanese ordered a halt. The two men with the shovels dug a grave or a pit um, 10 metres off the track. Uh, it wasn't too long before a one metre hole was dug. A cute later told Captain Graham's story what happened. Mavis was the first to be murdered. A Japanese soldier grasped her from behind and attempted to embrace her, but she struggled and almost managed to break free. The soldier plunged his bayonet into her side. She screamed and sank to the ground. May was now ordered to cover her face with a towel, but as she did so, she was bayoneted in the throat. The four soldiers dragged the bodies and threw them unceremoniously into the shallow grave, one on top of the other, and covered them with just a little dirt. As mm. soon as the Japanese left, Michael Coote covered the bodies with tarpa cloth and filled in the grave. He reported the grave's location to the Australians in 1943 after they liberated Buna and Gona. Uh, he led Doc Vernon to the grave site. The bodies were reinterred. They were later... Um, Reburied and they're still buried at Singapore Mission today. Uh, a series of long letters written by May and Heyman, uh, well, by May Heyman and Mavis Parkinson, which I quote extensively in the book. While escaping the Japanese over this four week period, were handed over to the Australian soldiers in 1943. And they're now preserved in the Australian War Memorial. And it's basically reading those letters that made me write the book just on the Kokoda. I realized mm. rather than having one or two page chapters on Kokoda, on Isuava, this was a book on its own. 
Our next slide, please. The slide, please. So, 12th in August, the Battle of Daniki, which takes place at the first battle, of the Owen Stanleys. Uh, and that's another story. That's yeah, it. well, I mean, absolutely brilliant. And uh, we, the first thing is we're having requests to invite you back, so we'll 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 sort that out. A um, couple of questions to sum up. The, the, you know, the, it got it got unashamedly pretty gruesome towards the end there. So, first couple of questions. One is. How many, if any, of the Japanese perpetrators of some of these crimes were ever brought to justice? That's the first None. question. None. Um, so the, the leader of the first battalion, he's the only one who survived. He was to be put on trial in Japan in the war, uh, but he committed suicide. Right. Basically, everyone else was killed. Um, right. They did search for them, and, and I, I do I do an apple of in the book, and I go about them yeah. hunting for the Japanese that did these atrocities, which I don't talk about here because that's, that's another Another subject, yeah. uh, but I go in a lot of detail. What happened to the um Papuan collaborators? Oh, god, yeah, what yeah. happened to the Japanese? Uh, but yeah, only as uh, who's in charge of the battalion, he survived the war. Uh, he was tracked down in Japan, he was to be tried, uh, but he committed suicide. Okay, and the second question is given the ghastly, hor horrific nature of some of those, those, those murders, has it meant that particularly in the years that swiftly followed the war the studies of this campaign were rather kind of unable to view the japanese military in anything other than barbaric terms and it therefore meant that we weren't able to understand the the, the fighting with the level of complexity it perhaps deserved because of the because of the over focus on the on the horrors uh spot on uh also talk about that as well um the australians uh, i won't talk for the americans but i think probably the americans felt the same way um Australians didn't have that hatred for the Germans and Italians they had for the Japanese. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the hatred of the Japanese was visceral. Um, I, I remember when I was going to school, um, a friend of mine and his father must have had him very late um, in the 70s. He's, he was a prisoner. His father was a prisoner of war. And uh, you mentioned Toyota and this guy would go into a fit. Um, he wouldn't have rice in the house. And mind you, he didn't get a lot, mm. they didn't get a lot of rice to eat anyway. But anything Japanese was just, oh, it was... That, um, but I, I can honestly say there were a few histories, uh, Paul's history, which is written fairly on is a great account. Um, and uh, he, he treats Japanese pretty pretty fairly. Uh, but there is, until recently, yeah, that, that is very true. And, and the whole campaigns have been coloured by this visceral hatred of the Japanese. Um, uh, and there is racism involved in that. Uh, but there's also it was pretty it's a pretty brutal walk. Um, mm, very few, yeah. no, no Australian prisoners in Papua were, were by the Japanese survived. Everyone that survived in any prisoners that were taken by the Japanese um, in the Kokoda track. Side Bitman, who he managed to escape. Everybody else was executed. And I talk about Isurava, a number of Australians uh, were captured. They were executed. Anyone that was found mm. by Japan, no one survived. All and mm. um, again, my my. Um, brother-in-law's um, father, he fought in Papua, and he gives this story. It might be um, possible, but uh, he'd always, he, he never drunk, but Christmas, he'd have a few drinks, and he'd talk about this one episode, and he'd talk about, oh, yeah, we, we took um, prisoners of the Japanese, and you know, we put them on planes, and um, we flew them to the Queensland, and um, the plane would land, it would start off with 30 Japanese prisoners, and that landed too. And the uh, officer said, well, what happened to the prisoners? And they'd say, oh, sir, they tried to escape. Meaning they basically mm -hmm. opened the doors and pushed them all out. Whether that actually happened or whether that's one of those stories that became possible during the war, I don't know. But um, yeah, the stories of the um, by Australians with the Japanese is quite different to what happened with yeah. recollections fighting Germans and Italians. Okay, thank you. My final question, which I realise is a, another big dis discussion point, is that I'm thinking of how Dieppe looms large over Canadian studies of everything yep. to do with military history. And for the Australians... Well, Gallipoli in the first of all, of course, is the, is the is the number one, but number two clearly is the Kokoda track stroke trail, depending on people's point of view. But that that interest, fascination with the track, and people going there on on epic kind of pilgrimages that is that a, is that a positive or a negative for the understanding of the wider campaign, or is it both? That's a positive. I, was, I mean, I've written a number of books on Gallipoli, and I've been to Gallipoli a number of times. And I was planning to go to Kokoda before I wrote these books, but because COVID hit in 2020, and um, so my plans have uh, been, been shelved. Um, but I'm, as an archaeologist, I'm actually designing a project to do an archaeological study of the Kokoda track right. to locate the original track. Um, and it's going to be a five-year study, and we're currently writing a proposal to do an wow. archaeological survey 
um, 20 kilometers of track each, each year. And um, yeah, because a lot of people do the track now, as I said before, people who do the track now, they're, they're walking about 50% of the original track, the other 50% mm. of the tracks are lost. And a lot of the battlefields that I go into um, are off the track. The track was a lot of fighting, but around Abari and other places at Royal Creek, major battles. I mean, Royal Creek, you've, you've got two brigades involved. Um, huge battle, um, which is usually a bit of a footnote um, in Kokoda. Uh, that was the advance back across. Um, yeah, but Kokoda, um, like Gallipoli, Kokoda stands out in World War II for Australians, like Gallipoli stands out in World War I. Um, and uh, a lot of Australians now going back, um, especially like tours like Historic or Kokoda, which um, I was going to go with there. They were an outstanding tour group. Who um, David Howell, who, who knows the track probably more than anybody, he's just walked it about 50 times. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people walk the track, but um, like I said, we're trying to actually get a team together to actually find the original track using radar imagery and, and LIDAR to strip back the vegetation and then find out where the where the foxholes are, where the tracks mm. are, and document the, the track, the wartime track. I'm not sure it, that it, It's a bit like, um, no, thank you, it has. It's a bit like um, the people who watch World War II TV, luckily, are the kind of people that will see something like Band of Brothers as a portal to understanding yep. the wider conflict. But there are others who stick rather rigidly with the obsession with Dick Wind. And I, I assume the same thing kind of applies to Kokoda. Is there some who know a lot about that? No, I'm not quite a little aspect, but that well-known aspect. But don't yeah, really like the, 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 the battalion of infantrymen are largely neglected. Um, mm. you know, they were the first to confront the Japanese. And um, a lot of books, uh, they're, they're hardly touched upon. And um, people talk about the Papuan carriers carrying the wounded out and carrying the, the ammunition. They were critical. And yeah. there's no, no doubt about that. But they were also fighting. They, were, they had their free O3s and they had their Bren guns and they were fighting Japanese as well. Uh, they've been forgotten. Um, and there were a lot of guys who, my, my four books, who um, who did amazing things and have hardly been talked about. Like, again, Watson, who, who led the Papua for Town, he's, he's hardly talked about. Um, and there's so many men that um, when you, you look at these battles that, well, I suppose. Having writing written four books, I can go in a lot of detail yeah. um, and, and talk about these guys. Because uh, basically all the books are written about, about Kokoda, basically most of them cover the whole campaign in one book, um, which is which is good. But uh, if you want the detail, yeah, it takes four books. And like yeah, I said, I was it's, it's, writing it's, this book as one book and turned into four. It's that whole thing is the more detail you go, the narrower – the view at the readership or viewership for goes for it. You know, I, I, I don't get the tens and tens of thousands of views because I'm, we're tackling subjects for 90 minutes. Plus the 10 minute histories get the, the millions of views because that's what a lot of people want. And the same applies to the books, you know, cover a whole campaign in 150 pages. Uh, you'll, you'll get more views than covering a whole campaign over four books with, with, with the, with the potential more in the future. But that's another a big discussion. Well, but I can say that if, if the one, if you want to get one, one volume book, on Kokoda, it's it's got to be Peter Bloom's A Bastard of a Place. It's yeah. a large book. It covers the whole Kokoda campaign. It covers the beachhead. It covers Milne Bay. It's a large book. But if you want just one one volume on the Kokoda campaign, that is a Peter Brune, A Bastard of a Place, is the book to get. Yeah, he Peter Brune came book. up in the sidebar conversation about the fact I should try and get him on the channel. I have tried. You a should. He's the master. Response, he's the Kokoda but... master. I, I call yeah. him the, the master of Kokoda. Brilliant. Anyway, it's been fantastic talking to you, David, and you'll get another invitation at some point. So it's been fantastic stuff. Again, I'll hold up the cover of the, the book there, or the one that we've talked about today. The links in the description below. And folks, thank you very much for your what your your questions, your comments. And David, thank you for being a guest. And I will see you again next time, everybody. This is Paul Woodhouse for World. Thank Book you very TV. much. Saying cheers. Bye, everybody. Bye.